Um, so as you can see, and we invite you to to go through some of those uh, in the coming uh, in the coming uh, days and weeks. We have uh, some uh, uh, fresh analysis uh, which we publish regularly. Um, you can see in the, the slideshow uh, of those uh, on those issues which are at the core of the Reset uh, mission. The website is actually operational uh, as uh, as you know since many years. But now we have just uh, refreshed a little bit, uh, as you can see, its uh, its graphics, and um, so we have uh, we have stories and see and analysis from uh, uh, around the world, from many regions, on um, exactly the topics we're we're discussing these days. So um, pluralism, be it in uh, in political, cultural, and religious terms, uh, but also uh, the uh, the difficulties of living together. Uh, in terms of uh, minorities and, and majorities, and uh, all the the challenges of uh, related to multiculturalism, as you can see from the pieces who are, which are passing by uh, in uh, in motion, where, where things are happening around uh, the world. And then uh, we have also uh, more uh, interactive, uh, uh, more interactive uh, things such as the videos, which are always, uh, I mean. Uh, also, a nice way to 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 uh, uh, to get the, uh, the the most interesting reflections. So, for example, you can see we have uh, um, some reflections of uh, renowned scholars. Uh, the last one is, for example, from French philosopher Michel Viviorca, and you will be able to uh, to see all all of the others. And uh, also, I wanted to to. Um, since the um, the topic of these uh, seminars this year are the is the balance and the difficult uh, the difficulties and the tension between the individual and the communities, I wanted to attract your attention finally on the dossier, which are let's say a gathering of uh, different articles and reflections on a given topic, which we have just launched last week. The this dossier is called uh, uh, a world without human rights, uh, of course, uh, with an. Uh, 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 it's, an, it's a question, an, an, in, an open question, um, and this is a, a debate that we are very happy to host, and we just has just started and will be will be proceeding in the next few weeks around uh, a, a very much uh, discussed paper, uh, academic paper, which uh, was out uh, uh, last year in 2019, called "The Tragedy of Human Rights" by Adam Seligman and David Montgomery. As you can mm -hmm. see, we have been uh, uh, happily granted uh, the permission to republish it from uh, the magazine Society. And you will be able, if you want, to read it here. It's a very interesting read, I think. And uh, it's very much related, uh, I would say, to the topic of this year's seminars. Uh, the, the authors, uh, in a kind of intellectual provocation, we can say, um, uh, re rediscuss and uh, re put in, into discussion the very, the very idea of human rights, not in the sense that of course, uh, they, they don't uh, certainly argue that people do not uh, uh, enjoy all the all the rights uh, which are the the, the basic uh, of our common living. But they uh, they accuse this notion of having forgotten the dimension of uh, um, of belonging, as we are discussing these days. So the collective dimension. This is a very interesting read, and uh, together with, Ms., uh, with Professor Silvio Ferrari from the University of Milan, we have thought of uh, opening a debate uh, on this. And uh, as you can see, we already have the first response here published just uh, yesterday and uh, from Professor Luzzati. And we will have many others from uh, a lot of, uh, I mean, several prominent authors and scholars, uh, philosophers essentially from around the world in the coming weeks. So we invite you if you wish also to follow this debate. Just to end up, and then we will uh, certainly uh, engage with the debate of today. Um, we wanted to, to remind you how you can also get involved in, uh, in this platform because it's an open platform always and it's not just a place where to read uh, things. So, um, of course, uh, you, um, you are always uh, uh, available to, um, uh, to attend our events, of course, as, as today, but uh, you can also um, I mean, for those who are engaged in research and or journalism, we are also always open to contributions to the debate or analysis of high quality on our topics. So you can always submit uh, 
article proposals. And finally, do not forget, you can always uh, sign up to our uh, newsletter, which is not a uh, spam, I can guarantee it's just uh, basically twice uh, a month for all our initiatives or um, find us on our social media, uh, Facebook and Twitter to uh, engage and, uh, and, uh, and spread the word of, with the, the work we do. Cool. Um, I thank you for, for your attention. Of course, if there are any questions on this, we are available and otherwise- Thank you, Simone. Thank you, Simone. I would, I would get back to, to Volker and, and Sofia for the start of the session. Thank you. Thank you, Simone. Thank you. We can move on. Okay. So shall, shall I just go? Okay, so um, thank you much. Thank you very much for being here. My name is Marcella Simoni. I teach here at the University of Venice, History of Israel and Palestine and Jewish History. And I'm very honored today to um, introduce our very distinguished speakers who are Anania Vajpei and Toshio Miyake. So I'm going to introduce uh, Professor Anania Vajpei first and Professor Miyake um, second. Um, so Anania Vajpei Vajpay is a scholar of history, literature, philology, and political theory. She's a fellow and associate professor at the Center of the Study of Developing Societies in New Delhi. In 2019-20, she is a visiting fellowship at CRASH, the Center for Research in the Arts, Social Sciences, and Humanities at Cambridge University. And she was, in 2012, the author of the prize-winning book, Righteous Republic, the Political Foundations of Modern India. Uh, she has also published and uh, co-edited other works and she has been involved with Reset since 2012, particularly in the Venice Daily Dialogue series, as well as the Istanbul um, series. Um, she lives in Delhi, London, and Istanbul, and her paper, the title of her paper today is India's Crisis of Citizenship, How the Pandemic Has Exacerbated the Erosion of Minority Rights. So the floor is yours. You have 20, 25 minutes, and then that will be followed by um, discussion. We take questions both by raising a hand in the chat or if you want to write um, a question or if you, you know, at the end, just um, book yourself for a question and then we'll moderate. Um, thank you, Professor Vajpayee, the floor is yours. Um, so thank you so much uh, to Reset uh, and all my old friends. Um, Uh, all my old friends at Reset, uh, Giancarlo, I see, and Volker, and Sophia. Um, I hope you can hear me. Yes? Can you hear me? Yes, very well, Ananya. Okay, okay. Um, yeah, I, I just wanted to start by actually congratulating Reset for going ahead with the Venice summer school more or less on time, because I know that Italy has really suffered in the last three or four months. It's been a terrible time for everyone, but it's been especially hard in Italy. And I think it's great that you are back and you're, uh, you have managed to find a way to bring us all together as we would have been um, in normal circumstances. Um, so congratulations for that. Um, I wanted also to actually begin by uh, showing everybody this book that uh, Volker and I have just co finished co-editing. It's just come out in February. Uh, it's called Minorities and Populism, uh, Critical Perspectives from South Asia and Europe. Uh, and it's a reset uh, project, which we finally finished and published. And the subject- Finally, is, finally, I underline yes, finally. <laughs> finally, <laughs> it's been a long time in the making. Many people uh, who are even participating today have been involved in it. Um, and it takes um, issues around minorities and populist, uh, 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 populist politics uh, in democracies in both South Asia and Europe. And it has critical perspectives um, over a very, very large spectrum of, of countries and regions. Um, so, I mean, not only is it a brand new publication, the reason I bring it up is because today I'm going to talk about exactly um, how this uh, uh, pandemic 
uh, and and the way in which uh, governments are handling it uh, in India, at least, is becoming yet another uh, occasion uh, for a majoritarian government to essentially find new ways to uh, to harass uh, and 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 question the citizenship of uh, or the right of, right to equal citizenship of minority communities, especially Muslims uh, in in India. So that's what I'm going to be talking about uh, today. Um, now, um, as you know, India has uh, in in May 2019. Uh, elected for a second term of five years, um, uh, a government led uh, with a huge majority uh, by, um, by the, a government led uh, by the Hindu nationalist party, the Bharatiya Janta party uh, called the BJP um, and uh, led by Prime Minister Narendra Modi. This was re-elected uh, with an even bigger majority for a five-year term in May 2019. Um, and in the first uh, term of the, uh, in, 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 in the first term of the, uh, of the BJP government, um, there was already an attempt to uh, really put minorities in their place uh, and possibly transform the nature of citizenship in India, which has been equal citizenship so far as mandated by the Indian constitution. It's not, uh, uh, your citizenship rights are not affected by your religion, your caste, your gender, or any other form of identity. Uh, so uh, the BJP has tried consistently to transform this uh, basic principle of equal citizenship um, uh, by claiming that India is not really a secular democracy, but rather a Hindu nation. Um, and so the primary citizens, in a sense, are Hindus uh, and people of other religions uh, are demoted to a kind of second class citizenship. There's no really legal way or constitutional way to do this, uh, so long as the constitution holds. Um, but um, what the government introduced after it had won its second very, very big mandate last year uh, was a new act of parliament called the Citizenship Amendment Act. Um, this was introduced uh, in November 2019, and it was passed into law by an overwhelming majority in the parliament, um, which uh, essentially has two dimensions. It's called the CAA, the Citizenship Amendment Act of 2019. One is that it, um, it invites uh, refugees uh, from... Uh, three neighboring countries, which are all Muslim majority countries, Pakistan, Afghanistan, and Bangladesh. Um, and it promises to provide Indian citizenship uh, to people coming into India from these countries, provided they are not Muslims. In other words, the, the condition is that they should belong to minorities within these Muslim majority countries, uh, especially if they're Hindus or Sikhs, and if they come into India, they will on a priority basis be given Indian citizenship as refugees or as asylum seekers, presumably from, uh, from a state of persecution that they may be facing in these Muslim majority countries. Um, so it's a kind of fast track to Indian citizenship for non-Muslims only from neighboring countries. Um, this is a very peculiar sort of a, of a, of a set of conditions uh, because there are hardly any people of this description coming in from these countries to India, but be that as it may, the second dimension of this new law um, is that everyone really is required to produce proof that they are already Indian citizens. And uh, in order to provide this proof, you need a number of identity related documents, which should be provided by the state, and which should show not only that you are Indian an Indian citizen now, but that you have been for several generations. So it includes the papers of your parents and your grandparents going back uh, a few generations. Uh, um, uh, and then only if you can produce these documents, will you be listed in the National Register of Citizens, which is a new kind of comprehensive citizen uh, register that the state is trying to create. Uh, 
Um, now, please understand that the population of India is around 1.3 billion and rising. Uh, and about 200 million Indians are Muslims. Um, and the majority of Indians of any religion or any kind of group uh, actually don't have uh, proper identity papers because they have never had a form of uh, necessary, mandatory, state-given, universal uh, identification uh, uh, on, on, on such a scale uh, so far in the Indian uh, context. The state has never provided this kind of consistent identity papers to everyone. So it becomes very difficult uh, for, uh, for most Indians to produce proof of citizenship. Um, and uh, this, this new register essentially uh, seeks to not only list all citizens, but also to exclude um, many, many Indians from the register. Uh, in other words, it is going to create both citizens and non-citizens, many, many, in a sense, for the first time under a kind of uh, universal identity scheme. Um, now, what is so alarming is that it is really in uh, Muslim majority areas within India that this form of identification is being insisted on and that people are being asked to provide papers. Um, and the assumption is that if you cannot show your papers, which mind you, most people cannot actually, uh, then uh, you are going to be either classified as a non-citizen or an illegal immigrant, especially if you happen to be Muslim. So the implication being that you've come in from other countries around, which are all Muslim majority countries, um, or you could even be declared stateless. Uh, and for the first time, uh, the Indian state is building gigantic detention centers in all parts of India uh, to house hundreds of thousands or tens of thousands of these newly created non-citizens whose citizenship is going to be thrown into question on account of this new law and this new exercise of putting together the National Register of Citizens and the National Population Register. So it's a very sinister exercise. And needless to say, um, many Indians, not only those who are of a secular persuasion, uh, but specifically uh, minority Indians and especially Muslims uh, have come out in huge numbers to protest this new uh, citizenship law uh, and to say that in a sense it targets them uh, and it seeks to disenfranchise them by essentially uh, robbing them of their citizenship, which they have had uh, from uh, for generations or for as long as anybody else, uh, and which they are able to prove or not prove just as well as 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 other communities. Um, so a series of massive public protests began immediately as soon as this law was uh, introduced as a bill in parliament and then it was passed into law and the protests uh, built up throughout uh, india throughout december and january of uh, 2020 um, and uh, at the forefront of these public protests were students um, uh, and muslims and very interestingly uh, in very large numbers for the first time in, in the public sphere, Muslim women. So really women all over India, Muslim women came out and said, we protest this law, this is clearly discriminatory and this clearly undermines the principle of equal citizenship, which India has had since independence and partition in 1950 when the constitution came into play. Um, now, the most uh, kind of celebrated of these protests uh, was in a, a kind of Muslim ghetto, uh, a neighborhood in Delhi called Shaheen Bagh. Uh, and uh, women, Muslim women, uh, many of them mothers or grandmothers, uh, 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 organized a sit-in, a continuous sit-in, uh, where they did not leave this space of Shaheen Bagh for days and weeks on end. And uh, eventually it became a very, very celebrated venue and uh, all the kind of 
protesters from all over the country came here, many intellectuals, many politicians, many artists, uh, many activists gathered here and they had continuously 24 seven, uh, a kind of uh, atmosphere like uh, you can imagine in Paris Square or Taksim Square uh, uh, and in other parts of uh, the Arab world a few years ago during the Occupy movements uh, uh, in the US uh, some years ago, it was building up into that kind of a space. Uh, so Shaheen Bagh became the epicenter of the um, anti-CAA uh, protests in India, um, as well as a couple of um, uh, progressive left-wing uh, university campuses in India, including the Nehru University in Delhi, and the Aligarh Muslim University uh, in, in, in uh, UP, um, uh, both of which have had a history of very uh, secular and progressive politics and uh, student politics. Um, so the government came down very hard on these protests. It came down very hard on these university campuses. Uh, and it tried repeatedly to shut down this kind of popular upsurge uh, of, of, of protest against the new laws. Um, and things had really reached a very uh, kind of high pitch of conflict between the government authorities and the protesters, uh, especially in the state of Delhi by February. Now, as it happened, Delhi had state elections uh, for Delhi state uh, uh, in February. And a non-BJP opposition party, uh, which was in power already, won the election again. Um, and this really bothered uh, the, the, the ruling party, the central government. Um, and uh, they triggered, um, they helped to trigger, BJP party members helped to trigger uh, terrible violence against uh, Muslims in a particular neighborhood in Delhi, not Shaheen Bagh, a different part of Delhi, uh, again, a kind of Muslim uh, locality. Um, and there was mass violence unleashed uh, against uh, Muslims and uh, about 50 to 100 people died and thousands and thousands of households and businesses uh, suffered. Uh, and in the entire neighborhood was, uh, it kind of went up in flames. We haven't seen this kind of violence in Delhi uh, in 30, 40 years, perhaps. Um, and it was very targeted against a certain community. So now under cover of elections, uh, followed by this kind of pogrom, mini pogrom against Muslims in Delhi, uh, the government imposed certain emergency laws against public, disallowing public gatherings, a kind of local curfew. Um, Section 144 is what it's called, where you can't gather more than four people uh, in a public space. Um, and uh, they also started arresting activists, students, uh, and in many cases, female Muslim student activists um, under a draconian law uh, for uh, national security and for the prevention of public disorder. Um, now these laws are leftovers from colonial times, but they're still very much there on the books. And they're often used to shut down dissent uh, and to, to target uh, dissenters against um, state authorities. Now at exactly this moment, at the end of February and in early March, when the government was trying in every way to shut down the protests against uh, citizenship laws, and then when it was using uh, violence uh, to, uh, to further kind of segregate and terrorize and contain uh, Muslim community, especially in the capital city of Delhi, um, the pandemic broke. And within a few days, uh, the government announced uh, the imposition of a national emergency uh, they imposed a law which is very rarely called into force called the National Disaster Management Act. Uh, and basically this achieves everything that uh, cannot be achieved under normal circumstances. It's a state of exception uh, and it, it suspends the rule of law. Uh, so obviously no gatherings, uh, no uh, public meetings, um, uh, no disobeying uh, police orders, uh, and the state turns into a kind of police state uh, and anybody can be arrested for 
for for breaking uh, the law or being perceived to break the law. Um, so since March 25th, uh, the government then proceeded to declare the largest lockdown in uh, the world. Um, India has been under complete lockdown uh, since then, except in the last 10 days or so, we've had a slight reopening. Um, and this has been the most astonishing kind of development. Um, now, the reason given for this lockdown is, of course, to try and contain the viral uh, spread and the infections uh, and to keep uh, the numbers of those dying because of the COVID epidemic very, uh, epidemic very, very low. Um, and India has had a lower uh, death rate and a lower count of cases uh, than even very, very small countries by comparison, uh, like Italy, like the UK. Um, uh, and uh, certainly the numbers are much, much smaller than in the United States. Um, uh, but it's also had the most draconian lockdown uh, of the entire world. Uh, I mean, I have literally not stepped out of my house for the last uh, nine weeks. I was, I was living in England. We came away from London because the situation was so dangerous in London. And we thought we would come to India and see what happens here. But now there's no possibility of leaving and returning. Uh, because all state borders are shut down, all international flights, all domestic flights, all public transport, uh, all schools and colleges. Um, the entire economy has come to a crashing halt. Um, and in fact, this has created a secondary humanitarian and economic disaster for India, which far exceeds the effects of the actual pandemic. Uh, I mean, there have been more people um, thrown into, into poverty and hunger and homelessness uh, and economic uh, sort of distress uh, because of the lockdown, um, then lives have been lost on account of, 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 uh, of the disease. Um, and, and this has created a, a whole other problem in India. But the, the overall effect of the way in which this government has, has tackled or tried to address the uh, situation, the public health emergency uh, has been once more to target minority communities within the larger uh, public health uh, situation. Uh, so I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, there's, a, there's a particular sect uh, among Muslims, it's a kind of reformist evangelical sect called the Tablighi Jamaat. Uh, and it has existed in South Asia uh, from, from the early 20th century. Uh, it's a very, very small group. Um, and they had, a, they had a gathering, a kind of worldwide gathering of Jamaatis uh, in Delhi uh, in mid-March. Uh, and many hundreds attended this gathering. This is just around the time that we were beginning to understand that there is going to be a, a pandemic and that it's, it's going to hit India as well. Um, so as soon as the government swung into action, they essentially went in and tried to say that the Tablighi Jamaat was trying to wage what was called Corona Jihad. Uh, in other words, that this gathering of Muslims was an epicenter uh, of, of, of uh, infection and that uh, the Tablighis who subsequently left Delhi and went all over the world, including as far as Malaysia and Indonesia and other parts of the Muslim world, that they were super spreaders, that they were somehow special, especially dangerous carriers of the disease and that they were spreading the disease everywhere that they went. Uh, from their gathering in Delhi in mid-March. Um, so the, the government really went after them uh, and, 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 and tried to, to, to kind of demonize them over and above any other vector, any other community, any other uh, sort of site of the, of the infection or, or the disease. Um, the second thing that the government has been trying to do, and I'll just wind up after that, is uh, that again, this is unique in the whole world, in the whole democratic world. Uh, they have developed an app which you're supposed to download on your smartphone uh, called Arogya Setu, which means something like the bridge of health. Um, 
and this is a uh, it's called uh, a contract a contact tracing app in other words it not only monitors your temperature and things like this but it also keeps track of anybody you come in contact with uh, in case you had the infection and you gave it to them uh, to try and see how the virus is spreading uh, through this kind of surveillance introduced at the level of the individual smartphone. Now, what this government has tried to do is encourage people to download this app, but it now intends to make it mandatory that every Indian will have to install this app on their phone. If you have a phone, you have to have the app. Otherwise, you can't get on a plane, you can't get on a train, you can't use public transport. Um, and basically, you have to voluntarily open yourself up for this kind of surveillance uh, so that at all times, they know who you came in contact with, where you went, who you met, how long you were there, uh, and, and, and so on. Um, now, again, I mean, this raises very grave concerns about fundamental rights of, of privacy, of mobility, uh, you know, of, 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 of uh, basically getting to move around without having the kind of state continually watching you in the name of protecting your health. Um, um, so this is something which is, they are now that the lockdown is going to open. Um, they are saying that we'll make it mandatory for you to have this app on your phone. Otherwise you won't be able to get on a bus or get on the Metro or, 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 or take a flight or get on a train. Um, and, and this is, uh, and the, the courts actually have refused to rule on this. Um, so in other words, uh, just to wrap up here, I think uh, the crisis in citizenship was already uh, pretty severe uh, when we were at that point and in late February. Uh, it was pretty clear that the government meant to target uh, minorities and especially Muslims. Um, and as soon as the situation became uh, uh, a public health emergency, uh, essentially, uh, the laws that were used to treat a uh, public health emergency were kind of doubly uh, enforced uh, when it came to minority communities and their movements uh, and their gatherings and their localities. Um, so in a sense, the assault on, on equal citizenship continues, but now under a different guise. Um, so this is where we are right now. I think the lockdown is about to open. The numbers are now going through the roof. Uh, and we haven't even reached the peak uh, yet uh, of our, our pandemic. Um, so it remains to be seen uh, what will happen um, in, in the coming uh, weeks and months. Uh, and I think I've run out of time. So I'm going to stop here. Thank you. Uh, thanks to you. And um, this was... Um, very, very interesting and very disquieting at the same time. And I'm sure that it also opens numerous perspectives for comparative approaches with other countries or maybe not. Uh, anyway, the floor is open uh, if we want to um, have a debate for about 20, 25 minutes. Yes, um, Alessandro Ferrara. Uh, <clears throat> can you hear me? Here's yes. Yes. Uh, thank you, Ananya, for this uh, uh, wonderful and, on, and at the same time warring uh, picture that you uh, drew. I just wanted to ask you for additional uh, clarification on one detail. You mentioned at the end uh, the courts not ruling on the, on the app, but more generally, India is famous for a very uh, revolu sort of activist uh, 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 Supreme Court, uh, Constitutional Court, uh, that uh, elaborated the basic structure uh, theory of the Constitution. Is there any, has there been any challenge of the uh, Citizen Amendment Act and the idea of the register that retroactively can push out of citizenship people who were basically accepted as citizens for not having the records of their parents and so on. Has this been challenged there? Is, it, is there any pronouncement of the court about uh, the constitutionality of this uh, in the debate? Well, this is the worrying part is that 
uh, you know, up until recently, um, no matter which government was in power, the court was always a kind of last resort uh, when it came to upholding the constitution. But uh, the Supreme Court um, has been consistently failing uh, to uphold the constitution. And uh, there's several reasons for this. One is the kind of uh, judges who are now in court, uh, who are in many ways uh, sympathetic to uh, the current government and who have in fact become judges on account of their, uh, their kind of inclination uh, to support uh, the current government. Um, and uh, secondly, the court has, has developed a tendency to say in uh, a lot of recent instances that um, where the parliament has passed a law by a clear majority or where the people have selected a certain leadership with uh, a clear electoral procedure, uh, it is not really up to the court uh, to try to change the direction in which uh, things are going. Um, so, uh, for example, uh, last year, uh, the government completely uh, abrogated uh, an article of the constitution which gave a kind of semi-autonomous status to the state of Kashmir vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis the rest of the Indian Union. And then sent Kashmir into the longest internet shutdown that the world has ever seen. So actually, Kashmir has been in lockdown from last August, not just for the last two months. Um, and the court uh, did nothing. Um, similarly, the government also uh, has uh, promised, the, the ruling party has promised to build uh, a Ram temple uh, in Ayodhya, uh, which was a disputed site for the last 27 years. There was a, a, a case mm -hmm. in court from the demolition of the Babri Masjid in 1992 till last year. Uh, that said, that decision came in 2019, November, uh, and the court essentially allowed the building of the temple in place of the broken mosque and said there should be a mosque, but it should be somewhere else, not at this location. Um, now, this is a complete abdication of the court's duty in upholding the rights of all citizens, not just the majority community, right? And it is continuing to do the same when it comes to the new citizenship laws, right? It is refusing to hear cases. It is arresting activists and dissidents. It's allowing the police to arrest them, but then not granting them bail, mm -hmm. um, not, not conducting trials, you know, not, not, not judging fairly uh, as to what these people are actually guilty of. Um, so there have been a number of arrests of uh, anti-CAA activists in the last few days, actually in the last few weeks and months. Um, and they have simply been uh, denied the right to appear in court. Uh, they've been not given any hearing, they're not given bail, they've been taken away to these jails. So yes, our courts are changing uh, and it's, it's making things extremely frightening for anybody who wants to go against uh, the policies, the majoritarian policies of this government. Thank you. We have two questions. Um, one uh, is going to be asked by Giancarlo Bosetti, and I'm asking Anania if she prefers to have two in like together, or if she wants to reply one by one. Would you prefer? You don't um, mind. Yeah, I don't mind. Whatever you, whatever's works for time, I mean. Okay, so um, I'm, um, I, I would ask uh, Giancarlo please to yes. um, yes. ask his. Thank I have you. a very, very simple question because all the stories we are listening uh, to uh, about uh, India, mm, look, I don't, I'm not reading the Indian press, just the international information that are quite a lot in the American press, the New York Times especially, uh, is following Indian things very well. And um, uh, are one-sided, uh, stories. There is just uh, one-sided stories of um, discrimination, oppression, uh, the populism, of majoritarian populism, and also tension among communities. But there is no, there is no, in in my view, I don't see that. Uh, this is my question. A political dialectic open, because after the 
uh, last defeat of the um, uh, progressive elite, of the Congress elite, uh, the people representing the Gandhian uh, legacy, uh, there is no in view a renewal of this elite. There is no, there is no, there is not uh, on the stage, as far I can see, a, a challenger of this situation. What, what's, what's your answer to that? No, it's true. I mean, uh, our opposition parties are either silent and helpless because they don't command a wide public following anymore, or uh, they have been co-opted. Uh, for example, the Aam Admi Party, which is the party which won in Delhi, which is not the BJP, um, the way in which they have uh, behaved towards the Shaheen Bagh protesters or towards the Muslims who were targeted uh, in communal violence in uh, late February is in fact no different from how the BJP would have behaved. So, you know, it, it looks like it's a different party, but it's effectively so afraid of alienating the majoritarian uh, Hindu voter um, that it is not going out and taking an oppositional stance in reality. So um, in that sense, the BJP appears to have captured uh, the whole political space, right? And the discourse is not varied. Uh, I mean, there are very small numbers of vocal uh, opponents. And most of those opponents are from civil society or they're from universities and uh, intellectual uh, sort of really kind of shrinking spaces. They are not, um, you know, this protest is not coming from the organized political opposition. And we are seeing in state after state, even where the BJP doesn't have a state, uh, state level government where, it, you know, provincial elections have been won by other parties. Uh, these governments are extremely weak. Uh, and the BJP, the central government continuously makes it very difficult for them to survive. Um, and now under cover of this lockdown, um, you know, there needs to be a lot of uh, centralized power and a lot of cooperation between different parts of India. Um, and it's very interesting that the different states, it's like they're different countries because they have such a different situation in terms of the health statistics and in terms of how this disease has affected different parts of the country, different populations, different temperature zones, uh, et cetera. Um, and you can see systematically that the government is targeting opposition states, leaving them to their own devices and creating economic and other kinds of hardships for them so that they are not able to manage their pandemic uh, within their boundaries. Um, so this is a genuine problem, Giancarlo. I think it's not just that, um, you know, you, you, do, you do see, I mean, you do see a, a strong criticism of the Indian government more and more in the international media, but you're not seeing that in the Indian media. And, and there is no political voice, even the Nehru Gandhi family, um, they're not really able to carry uh, public opinion with them. Uh, so effectively, this government feels like they don't really have to explain themselves uh, because everybody's on their side, um, you know, and it's a very dangerous kind of uh, impression, at least, of consensus. Um, I don't know what the reality is. I mean, there are so many minorities and there are so many uh, communities which are uh, negatively impacted by this kind of politics. Surely they must be feeling some opposition but how they are going to express this uh, if they are not voting against the BJP, I don't know. Thank you. Thank you very much. I read here three questions uh, that I'm going to repropose to you. You can see them also on the, um, on the chat. So the first one is from uh, Rui Marquez, um, which is about the differences in populism in India, um, how, how is populism in India different from the West, like for example, Italy or Germany, or are there some commonalities? And this is the first question. The second one uh, from Shashikant Pandey is, um, 
So he says, uh, on the one hand, you accept that India has a fairly limited number of cases. And on the other hand, you describe lockdown as draconian. So can you tell us what was the alternative before government? By the way, even leading agencies have said that had India not opted for lockdown, things would have been, um, would have already, uh, sorry, would have worsened. And then the third question um, is about um, if the pandemic has represented somehow an opportunity uh, to develop new alternative forms of mobilization against uh, citizenship amendment act. And if yes, how? Thank you. Now, there are two more questions, but, um, but I think we should stop here for a first round because uh, thank you. Well, look, I think that first question about the difference between populism in India and other places, I mean, uh, you know, this is a huge question. And uh, I don't know that I can begin to answer it in the small kind of scope of this talk or the kind of time that we have. But I will say that uh, this volume <laughs> is the answer to that question, uh, because we have had a long uh, and deliberation on precisely this question, right? Like how do you compare populisms, right? How do you compare left-wing populism and right-wing populism? How do you compare populism in a democratic uh, context and in an authoritarian context? How do you compare old style populists and new populists uh, who are appearing all over the world? How do you compare India and Europe or South Asian countries and European countries or Western democracies? So we've, we've kind of tried to address all those questions in this volume. And I would really encourage you to go and take a look at it and especially read um, uh, the, the, the introductory materials, which uh, try to take a broader view, uh, you know, looking across the world. Um, so I, I, I'll, I'll just leave that there. On the last question, and I'll just go to the middle one after, after that, the last question, you know, are there new opportunities? Uh, are there new opportunities for uh, mobilization? Uh, I mean, right now, no. I mean, you you know, you literally. I mean, the degree of compliance uh, to the with the lockdown in India has been stupendous, especially in in the cities and in the upper and uh, sort of middle class neighborhoods. Um, people have not gone out. If at all they can afford it, if they are not desperate, uh, if they can stay at home, they, ha if they have homes to stay in, they have stayed at home. And so the question of mobilization uh, does not arise. I think there's in fact been a tremendous demobilization um, where, where the protests had reached a certain kind of climax. Uh, all of that has been lost uh, in, in, in the last two months. So this is something that um, I, don't, I don't know how, um, uh, you know, uh, op oppositional thinkers and forces are, and parties are going to have to regroup uh, once, once the situation eases, if it eases anytime in, in the near future. Um, finally, this question of the lockdown. You know, uh, I think, um, uh, there was just a, 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 a the, 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 there was just an article in the New York Times today explaining why India has not had such bad numbers, and a lot of it has to do with the median age of the population. Um, that you know the demographics are such that even in Pakistan, Bangladesh, uh, and India, in the entire subcontinent, uh, the population is very young, and so. Uh, you've had a very high proportion of, of COVID-related deaths in countries where the population is relatively old. So if there are more old people, then they're more likely to die if they get this infection. And this is what has happened in Italy. This is what has happened in the UK, in, um, uh, especially in, in homes for older people, uh, and of course, in the United States. The Indian population, the South Asian population as a whole is very young. So it's less affected. That's one of the reasons it's less affected. Um, the second issue is, of course, we had to have a lockdown, but we did. The government did not prepare the population or itself for the for the extent, duration, and rigidity of this lockdown. And so, a lot of um, you know millions of migrant workers who basically come from villages, work in the city. 
uh, have have sort of a, a daily wage uh, kind of economy uh, a subsistence level of 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 their of their earnings they don't have savings um, they did not have a chance to go home right and the government did not make any arrangements for them to return to the villages and to just stay there right uh, they could not afford to continue living in the city without their uh, daily economic activity and their 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 uh, work which was completely shut down um, they could not travel um, and at some point people just started walking uh, and and you must have read these stories uh, you know everywhere in the in the in the press that millions of indians this is the largest migration internal migration within the indian subcontinent since partition since 1947 millions of people are literally trying to walk home and it's hot and it's far and they don't have food and they don't have a place to stay and hundreds of people have died on the way from exhaustion from road accidents uh, in one case people fell asleep on a railway uh, track and they were run over by a train uh, i mean it's it's been a humanitarian disaster there's no other way to put it now had the government made a slight change to their plans and thought about easing into an economic lockdown at the same time as trying to manage the public health emergency getting hospitals Uh, prepared getting the equipment getting the testing etc and taken care of these homeless poor people uh, the migrants um you know it's possible that the overall outcome of the lockdown would have been positive rather than negative but that hasn't happened um and so a lot of the advocates of the lockdown you know demographers health economists doctors uh you know world health organization have been saying that on balance this lockdown was too dire it was too sudden it was too long uh and now we have to reopen the economy because we can't afford to keep it closed but we are not going to be able to keep the numbers down going forward into june july and august um Thank you so much for these. I know that there are many other questions uh, that are appearing on my chat, but unfortunately, we have to um, stop this first uh, part of our uh, session here um, for reasons of time and of coordination with our interpreters and you know for the smooth running of the um, of the whole conference. Oh, sure. So th no, thanks to you, <laughs> thanks to you, and um, um, maybe we can, if you agree, we can forward you these questions. Uh, Uh, by email and then yeah, uh, yeah sure. if you agree sure. Uh, sure. then Sofia can uh, if, if that's okay with you thank you so thank you so uh, much thank thanks you to you thanks yeah. to you um, so it's now uh, let me uh, introduce our um, second uh, speaker for today professor Toshio Miyake who's associate professor at the department of Asian and North African studies I would like to say here at Kafoskar University of Venice um, his research concentrates on occidentalism orientalism and self orientalism in Italy Japan relations as well in, as the public sphere in contemporary Asia um, he published uh, two books the first one is entitled monsters of japan narratives figures and hegemonies of identity displacement in 2014 and also in 2014 rethinking nature in contemporary japan science economics and um, economic and politics now the title of his uh, paper today is chin chun chan neo orientalism and cultural racialization in italy at the time of covid 19 Um, thank you very much, Tashir. The floor, floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Marcella. Good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon to all of you. Uh, or good evening or good morning, wherever you are. I'm Tashir Miyake, speaking from uh, my home in Venice. And I would like to thank also to uh, the organizers of Reset for giving me the opportunity to participate, to participate in this conference. So I would like to share with you uh, my slides of the PowerPoint presentation. So let me see 
think this works. Okay. Can you see the slides? Sir? Yes. Okay. Yes. Perfect. So. so let's see. Just a second. Okay. So let's start with a look on the summary of my talk. Uh, first, I will address the so called China virus pandemic triggering. Uh, uh, social panic as well as amplifying social stigma and racial attacks uh, against the so-called Orientals uh, during the last months. Uh, second, I will analyze uh, uh, the popular expression of Ching Chung Chang um, or Ching Chong in English, which has often complemented these racial attacks uh, and which may offer some insights about the increasing conflation of linguistic, cultural and ethnic ethnic racial othering. And third, I will present some conceptual tools such as cultural racialization and orientalism in order to offer a critical interpretation of these recent events. And finally, I will try to offer some concluding or better provisional remarks about these events that are still unfolding uh, before our eyes. Okay. Uh, now the first part, uh, on the slide you may see a very revealing uh, satirical cartoon published on the Italian newspaper La Repubblica on the 13th of January, actually before the COVID pandemic outbreak in Italy and before the face cases have been reported. Uh, my apologies for this clumsy translation to English and also for the following translations in the other slides. It reads, uh, no problem. If the virus arrives in Italy, we are prepared. The fascist looking character on the left says, we have already uh, attacked and insulted every passing Chinese. And his comrade on the right uh, replies, this is called uh, prevention. Uh, so let's have a look to some of these preventive measures that occurred in Italy. This episode refers to students of Chinese studies actually enrolled at our Kafoskal Universities, a uh, university and Italian citizen of Chinese origin. I quote the article, uh, Venice, a student of Chinese origin, reports racist insults and spits from two boys on a train. Uh, Valentina Wong got on a train on her way back from university to home and has been assaulted by two 16 years old boys. She posted this bad episode on Facebook, which became a uh, viral, end of quote. Actually, in Venice Historical Center, uh, many other similar episodes have been reported involving also Chinese and other Asian tourists. Sorry, I have some problems with my presentation. Okay. Uh, this incident on this slides occurred to uh, uh, Queen Zhang, a 26 years old Chinese man residing in Italy since the last 10 years. Uh, he was trying to enter a gas station in Vicenza to ask to change a 50 euro bill, but was refused and was followed by insults and physical assault by men, a client inside the gas station. A quote, coronavirus, a young Chinese assaulted in Binet region, they broke a bottle on his face and nobody defended me, end of quote. Actually, Valentina Wong reported too that nobody defended her in the train from the assault of the teenagers who spat on her. This incident happened in Sardinia's region. I quote, Demetrio, the Filipino from Assemini, in Cal uh, close to Cagliari in Sardinia region, savagely beaten because a Chinese who infects with the virus. Thanks to God, I'm saved. Mistaken as a Chinese and beaten on a bus, facial and cranial trauma, one month of treatment for the 30 years old who has been beaten up on the number nine bus. Carabinieri are chasing the attackers. The victim has two children is one of the waiters of the Golden Week restaurant in Marconi Avenue. Italian media reported many other similar episodes uh, occurred, especially between January and February, before the start of the national uh, lockdown, 
when most people were still on the streets. Among these episodes, there have been countless number of Chinese stores and restaurants that have been vandalized and complemented with this kind of disturbing writings. Uh, murderous China, boycott it, uh, by Italian, boycott Asian traders, the bosses of economy at our place, go away yellow muzzles or gooks, uh, Chinese, Jews, same life, same oven. Chinese, you are a sewer rat. Okay. Sorry with my slides. It's the first time that I'm doing this. Well, it was not until February 21 that the first class of COVID have been reported in Italy, specifically northern region of Lombardia and Vento, the director of Amnesty International in Italy already sounded the alarm a few weeks before on February 4th, warning about a shameful wave of xenophobia, explaining that this was happening particularly at the expense of children. In fact, many schools and parents of Italian children had already begun in January to block, at least to try blocking Chinese children or children of Chinese origin to attend classes. Maybe the most covered episode by the media is this one, uh, which reached also international attention, arguably because most of the addressed students were not Chinese or Asian immigrants, but visiting foreign students who denounced this incident on social media and the national newspapers. The Santa Cecilia Conservatory of Rome, one of the most prestigious music schools in Europe, suspended classes for students of Chinese, Korean, and Japanese origin until they passed the medical examination as part of a preventive quarantine measure. Uh, these are the initial lines of the letter sent by the director of the conservatory to the 160 teachers of the music school. I quote, dear colleagues, because of events related to the Chinese epidemic, the lessons of Oriental students, Chinese, Korean, Japanese, and so forth, are suspended, end of quote. Please note the use of the term Orientals, which is still common in Italy, but which also shows how the anxiety and social stigma had been extended to everybody looking somehow Chinese, regardless of actually having been in mainland China or Wuhan, or regardless of being Chinese at all. Sorry. Okay. In fact, being personally a Japanese living in Venice since the last 20, 20, 30 years, I've experienced also my person the growing and widespread social panic in everyday life directed to the so-called oriental looking people, including many of my friends and acquaintances. Just two examples. On the left is the Facebook post by an Italian jazz musician married to a Taiwanese woman, working with Japanese friends in Alberobello, actually in the Puglia region. She reports how they have been insulted by some boys on a bicycle shouting, you Chinese suck. On the right is the Facebook post of a Japanese woman, a Japanese language teacher, and my colleague at Kafoska University, married to a Venetian man. Actually, this episode occurred a few months later, on April 28th, when the lockdown rules started to loosen, and she was happy to take a liberating walk after a long period of self confinement at home. However, during her window shopping in Venice with her 20 years, 12, 12 years old boy, she reports how she has been insulted by a group of local teenager girls laughing and shouting at them, uh, oh, these people suck. Okay, just a second. Uh, now it must be stressed that despite this increasing episodes of symbolic and physical violence, public opinion, newspapers, and also uh, main right-wing politicians and mayors in Italy take uh, in Italy openly condemned all episodes of racial assaults against residents of Chinese uh, or East Asian descent. It must be also added that racism against Asians triggered by COVID has not been limited to Italy, but actually involved most European countries or maybe actually most countries in the whole world. If you may be interested to a broader context, you can have a look to the report on coronavirus pandemic in the Euro uh, European Union 
uh, edited on April by the European Union Agency for Fundamental Rights, which includes and uh, also a, a specific chapter on uh, racism. Furthermore, you may find a Wikipedia list of incidents of xenophobia and racism related to the COVID-19 pand pandemic. I've downloaded the PDF version and the list uh, of the list and it's always uh, already 60 pages long. However, turning our attention back to Italy, I would like to point out to some deep-rooted ambivalence in the public media discourse regarding these incidents. In my view, this ambivalence cross-cuts ideological or party membership, but is mostly evident in the Lega Nord uh, party discourse. As you may know, Lega Nord is a right-wing populist party of the opposition, which at present, according to opinion polls uh, about voters' intentions, would be the first party in Italy. Let's start with Vittorio Feltri, a journalist, actually the most influential right-wing journalist in Italy, who is known for his misogynist, homophobic and openly gracious racial remarks against people in South Italy and against immigrants from Northern and Sub-Saharan Africa. Actually, in January 2015, he was nominated candidate for president of Italy by Lega Nord and Brothers of Italy, which together are supported by more than 40% of the electorate in Italy. So he could be maybe the future president here. This article was published on January 13th on the journal Libero that he himself has founded in the middle of increasing racial attacks against the Chinese community in Italy. A quote, the Chinese are more intelligent than us. The coronavirus plague will be cured. Maybe this is the reason why they are victims of racism. They live secluded in their own neighborhoods. Uh, they mind their own business. They do not disturb. I asked for myself why Africans are generally not welcomed with friendliness in our country. And I have an answer. I've never seen a yellow person loitering across the street and looking for charity. I'm not surprised by the success obtained by people with almond eyes in the whole world. I imagine that the plague of the virus will soon be cured, even if some news from the land of the rising sun are disturbing. The stated the pollution feeds on leaf uh, insects and animals swallowing them without precautions. However, don't forget that in the Bergamo valleys, my fellow countrymen used until the 1970s to feed on frogs, small birds, and eels. We don't have the right to deplore the Chinese. In our small way, we have been Chinese too, end of quote. So on the one hand, we have a perfect example of Orientalism, racialization, and essentialism where yellow, almond, eyed people, Chinese or Japanese are basically the same. But on the other hand, they are worthy of appreciation, even of admiration, because they share common aspects as Northern Italians, at least the Northern Italians of the past. Now let us have a look at Luca Zaya, the president of Veneto region, of which the city of Venice belongs to. He's a member of the Lega Nord, official member, but despite showing quite a low profile in his political career and not being the top leader of, at the national level, he actually managed to write during the COVID, COVID pandemic to become very popular. According to opinion polls in late April, he is the second most popular politician in Italy, second only to the prime minister, Giuseppe Conte. On the left, he posted immediately on his official Facebook page a message of solidarity to Valentina Wong at the same day that the racial assault has been reported on newspapers. I quote, a student of Chinese origin, insult, origin insulted on a train. A shame, it's uncivilized. What happened on board on the train to Valentina, the young lady offended by spits and unspeakable epithet is unworthy of civil society. My solidarity and the solidarity of all decent people with Valentina, end of quote. However, one month later, during a program at a local TV station, uh, Antenna 3 North Est, sorry, uh, he made, uh, which actually raised, uh, uh, sorry, 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 which actually raised to become the most uh, popular. Uh, local TV station with the highest viewing rate in Italy, thanks especially to Zaya's frequent interventions, he commented with these words about the reason behind the relative low contagion rate, uh, at least in Veneto region. I quote, the hygiene that our people, the Veneto people and the Italian citizens have, the cultural training we have is that of taking a shower, of washing, of washing one's hand often. 
It is a cultural fact that China has paid a big price to this epidemic because we have seen them all eat mice, living mice, or things like that, end of quote. The following day, the embassy in Italy of the public, uh, People's Republic of China sent official protest against the statement, and Zaya quickly apologized, rem remarking that he didn't intend to offend the Chinese people. Just to close the circle between journalist Faithley and politician Zaya, this is the tweet posted by Faithley after Zaya has been obliged to apolo uh, apologize. I quote Zaya is right, some Chinese do eat dogs, mice, bats, and live octopus, fresh food that which isn't good for health, end of quote. So what are the sources of people like Zaya or Feitri saying, seeing Chinese eating living mice or things like that? This is only a small glimpse of the endless amount of fake news and metropolitan, metropolitan legends about supposed Chinese and the cruel or disgusting eating habits that went viral on YouTube and social media, especially during Jap January this year. On the left, a quote eating a live mouse in a Chinese restaurant. Here's the video, strong disgusting images of a Chinese man eating a live mouse after digging it in a sauce, end of quote. On the right, China virus girl eats a bat at a restaurant, the animal to which it is suspected that the disease has started. Actually, what can be noted is that these fake news had been widely diffused by local newspapers like the Gazzettino in Veneto region, which participated actively in this China Chinese bashing related at least to the bats. So one point that I would like to stress is that there is always a kind of ambivalence in public, political, or media discourse addressing these attacks. And I would also suggest this ambivalence is not limited only to populist or right-wing discourses, but involves to a certain extent also left-wing political and media discourse, contributing to a more wider and deep-rooted social stigma in fact, symbolical physical violence against the so-called Chinese or so-called rentals has not started in January, but have sadly a very long history, not only in Italy, but also in other countries. In my view, the difference during the COVID epidemic is increased visibility of these attacks, due especially to wider media coverage. So on the one hand, there's no doubt about institutional, public, and nonpartisan uh, condemnation of racial attacks against people of Chinese or East Asian origin. However, on the other, you may find always some addition, some specification of more or less negative aspects attributed to China or the Chinese. I'm not a specialist of Chinese immigration in Italy. However, I've tried to provide provisional list. So besides the accusation of being the origin of COVID-19 and having hidden it for a long time to the, uh, to the world, other negative associations are often added, which have been uh, accumulated during the last decades. Authoritarian state, invasion of Tibet, absence of civil rights aiming at global hegemony, uh, racism against Africans and even Euro-Americans, unfair economic and commercial competition, no respect for international rules, uh, labor exploitation, cheap and shoddy goods, environmental pollution, illegal trade of protected animals, disgusting or cruel eating habits, uh, Chinese immigrants seen as self-secluded and ethnically homogeneous community, characterized by tax evasion, prostitution, complicity with organized crimes, and so forth. Now, all these attributions or labels are rooted in a kind of essentialist conflation, assuming a kind of equivalence between China as a state and Chinese people, cultural race. The effect of all this is that there has been, especially in the past, a general downplaying or denial of racism against Chinese or East Asian people. This is due to a large extent to the intersecting effect of two naive or paternalistic pillars of common sense. One, racism is possible only against poor or Islamic people. Two, racial attacks are very rare and only done by a minority of ignorant, violently, possibly fascist people. The following slides are about uh, institutional statistics and surveys on views about China in different countries, as well as data about Chinese immigrants and the difficult integration in Italy. But due to time limits, we can skip these numbers and data, which you may consult also after this talk, maybe. And we, we go directly to the second part of my talk, which may offer some further insights about two aspects that I've tried to stress before about the racial attacks. One, they're not limited only to Chinese nationals or Italians of Chinese origins, but are extended uh, indistinctively to all East Asian looking people 
that persons who have been defined also as Orientals. And two, the wider completion of cultural, national, and racial ethnic aspects. Now, besides your Chinese or your Chinese virus, one of the most common epithets or words used during attacks on East Asian people or Italians of East Asian uh, descent is a popular expression, Ching Chung Chang, although it is rarely reported in the news. Ching Chung Chang is the equivalent to the English uh, Ching Chong. Actually, this expression has been widely used before in Italy. I myself have been addressed uh, hundreds of times especially in the streets by children or groups of teenagers, mostly male, uh, who would shout even from long distance, ching chung chang and laugh. These on the slide are the conventional definition of this expression. It is used to point or to mock and play on the Chinese language and people, people of Chinese origin, East or Southeast Asian languages and people, or people of East or South Asian uh, descent. Uh, so, there's a kind of essentialist conflation of language, culture, and ethnicity and race. Furthermore, it is perceived as irritating, pejorative, or racist by most people addressed by these terms. On the contrary, uh, most people using these terms tend to emphasize funny, humor humorous, playful, light intentions without offensive or racist purposes. So we have a kind of polarized perception and interpretation of these terms. From a more linguistic point of view, this expression can be considered as a, an imitation of Chinese seeming sounds to an Italian speaking ear. The chi indicates the perceived frequency of voiceless coronal affricates, uh, um, while the n points to the perceived abundance of nasal sounds in syllab codas in many varieties of Chinese. Social linguistic scholar Elaine Chun, who is the author of a very interesting analysis of these expressions in the US context, has stressed a pattern of antiphony in which repeated syllables differ by a single vowel. In the case of Italian, the E is followed by the U and eventually by the A, like exp in expressions such as bim bum bam, bim bum bam. In English, the E is followed by the O, like king kong, ping pong, tick tock. Furthermore, quoting Elaine Chung, this bivalent word, which belongs to two languages at once, serves less to disrupt this linguistic boundary than to refine it. So, as far as I know, Ching Chung Chang has an unclear historical origin in Italy. In the English speaking world, it has been found as early as the late 19th century in children's songs. Now, looking at the wider semantics, this expression reminds the same etymological and cultural logic as the term barbarian or barbar in Italian, originating both from the ancient Greek barbaros. Barbaros has been considered an onomatopoeic word, barbar, bar, to imitate the sound of non Greek speakers like Egyptians, Persians, Phoenicians, and so forth, in order to indicate something incomprehensible gibberish, unpleasant, more close to animal sounds. We can see this still in the Italian verb borbottare, meaning to mumble, or balbettare, meaning to stutter. At a later stage, cultural and civilizational meaning have been attributed to the word, which has been used to refer to alien, primitive, inferior, uncivilized, inhuman behavior and people, in contrast to the Greek, Roman, or so-called Western civilization. So we could suggest that it's, uh, to a certain extent uh, that the expression Ching Chung Chang or Ching Chong could represent the modern barbarian or oriental or other of Western or white identity. There's another aspect of the use of Ching Chung Chang or Ching Chong that makes the conflation or overlapping of culturalist and racialized attribution particularly evident. The expression Ching Chung Chang, at least in my experience in Italy, is often complemented by the slanted, slanted or almond ice chester, this one, as you know. You can see this in a scene from the Pippi Longstocking, uh, from Pippi Longstocking in 1969, based on the famous character created by Astrid Lindgren. Let's see if you, okay, thank you. You, it's in a, it's in a Okay. 
This scene has been actually removed in occasion of its national TV airing in Sweden in 2014. Now, very interestingly, while the use of Qing Chun Chang is mostly restricted to children or young people, the slanted eye gesture is more widely used also by adults, including curiously some of our students of Chinese or Japanese studies with the intention to express uh, appreciation or homage to Chinese or Japanese people and culture. Uh, this is Maria Giovanna Elmi, uh, a former Italian television announcer and presenter, a celebrity in Italy, posing for a weekly journal by paying homage at least in her attention to Japanese culture during her stay in a Japanese hot spring to celebrate her silver wedding with her husband. While the previous photo, as many other ones, has passed completely unnoticed or unchallenged by Italian public opinion, this one received more attention because in this case, there was a specific addressee who didn't appreciate the gesture. This photo was posted on Instagram by Michelin star chef Gianluca Guarini a few months ago. He has been chosen during an international culinary competition called Engats to pair with another chef, Victor Leong, a Chinese Australian chef from Melbourne. In order to celebrate this exciting partnership and pay homage to his oriental partner, he took the selfie with his staff putting supposed Chinese rice farmers hats and making this landed age eye gesture. Unfortunately, Victor Leung didn't appreciate this photo at all and accused the Italian chef of racism, an accusation that was covered by international press like NBC. Actually, Gianluca Guarini apologized instantly, but very interesting, most Italian newspapers considered it a wrong accusation because the declared intention of the Italian chef was of sincere friendship and transcultural uh, curiosity. One of the most interesting comments on social media about this incident was this uh, one posted on Twitter by another chef. I quote, funny thing is that most people, uh, racist people I know, always insist that they aren't as if that corrects it all, end of quote. The last comment may shed some light also to one of Italy's recent anti-racist campaign, which backfired against its good intentions. It happened last December, uh, actually the same month as a previous Chef Corini's incident in the light of increasing and disturbing racist insults during soccer games against players of African origin who have been targeted with racist chanting and monkey sounding holes, the leaders of soccer uh, top league Celia A decided to start an anti-racism campaign showing three monkeys, one with blue eyes referring to white or Caucasian players, one monkey with brown eyes referring to black or African people, and one with slanted eyes referring to Asian people. While the artist's intention was to show some kind of universal equality, hinting that all races have evolved from monkeys, these images spurred heated criticism, especially by soccer players of African region who uh, were supposed to be pleased or feel protected by this. Now, in order to, to make some more sense of all these recent events, I would like in the third and final part uh, of my talk to introduce some concepts that may offer a more theoretical and analytical perspective. The first is a conceptual distinction between racism and racialization. Racism refers usually to the unfair treatment of people who belong to a different race, or it may indicate violent behavior towards them. Furthermore, it is defined as a belief that some races of people are better than others. Instead, racialization refers to a process of ascribing ethnic or racial identities to a relationship, social practice, or group. It begins by attributing racial meaning to people's um, identity and in particular as they relate to social structures and institutional systems. Racialization is a concept that allows to think of racism as a process and construction. It depends on the fundamental assumption or belief that races actually exist and are an intrinsic aspect of people in order to distinguish them one from another, regardless of supervising, inferiorizing, or egalitarian intents. So building on the concept of racialization, it is possible to suggest that there is no substantial difference between people who hate people, uh, uh, between people who hate or people who love other races. As long as they believe in the existence of races, both may jointly participate in the production of racial identification as the ultimate and primary 
principle of social organization. However, as we've seen with the Qin Chung Chang expression and slanted eye gesture, the racialization process has become much more effective in the last decades by conflating biological and cultural aspects attributed to the other or eventually to one's own identity. In other words, racialization based on biocultural essentialism has accomplished the task to reproduce itself, adapting to the new requirements of the post-industrial, post-modern, increasing globalizing age. Quoting from philosopher and race studies scholar Pierre-André Taguyev, to simplify the question, one may distinguish three fundamental operations, three great uh, shifts of basic concepts, arguments, or dominant attitudes in racializing ideology since the early 1970s. From race to ethnicity and culture, from inequality to difference, from heterophobia or fear of the other to heterophilia, love of the other, end of quote. In other words, it hints to the ineffectiveness of recent and arguably present anti-racism, as long as both neo-racism and anti-racism share basically the same essentialistic assumptions and ideology. If you consider more specifically cultural racialization shaped by essentialist assumptions of East Asian cultural people, we may in addition refer to Edward Said's influential theory on Orientalism. This is the imagined geography of civilization identity and authority, which has been foundational to Euro-American colonialism and imperialism. On the left, the so-called West, the civilization labeled attributed to Euro-American hegemonic identity, defining itself by binary contrast to the so-called subaltern East. One of the main identifying paradigms attributed to the so-called West has been modernity, in contrast to the idea of tradition, a contrast that can be further declined through other oppositions such as a rationality, technique, science versus emotion, nature, mysticism, society, individualism versus community and groupism, white race versus colored races, maturity versus infantilism, masculinity versus femininity, art innovation versus uh, ritualty repetition, history and progress versus free and freedom versus myth, uh, status and with status and oppression. Now to conclude, in my view, one crucial aspect to understand the process of Orientalism, as well as any kind of cultural essentialism, is its underlying and ambivalent structure. I suggest that it is this double structure, a kind of double bind that eventually, that actually makes Orientalism so hegemonic or influential, or we may say naturalized, and mostly invisible. It is this ambivalence that contributes making the kind of hegemonic blind spot within wider common sense, capable to, uh, capable to adapt to different times, places, contexts, and individual persons. In other words, rephrasing the previous consideration of racialization that depend on essentialistic assumptions about the existence of races, regardless of considering them superior, inferior, or equal, the same applies to rentalism. As long as there are widespread assumptions about the existence of civilizational entities such as the so-called West or the East, Western Eastern civilizational people, then these assumptions will be influential in producing hegemonic orientalism, regardless of people being haters or lovers of so-called oriental people or civilization. So on the slide, you may see the two sides of the same coin. On the one side, you may see heterophilia, superization, admiration of the so-called East and Orient, emphasis on aspects such ancient spirituality, mysticism, aesthetic refinement, harmony with nature, communitarian solidarity, continuity of traditions, female sensuality, martial arts, and so forth. All these apparently positive aspects may cumulatively contribute to shape the so-called Orientals as superhumans. While on the other side, you may have the apparent, uh, apparently the opposite, heterophobia, inferiorization, discuss for the East or the Orient. In other words, emphasis on aspects such as irrationality, infantilism, authoritarianism, indistinct masses, religious fanatism, copycats, economic or political threat, unfair competition, cruel criminals, urban alienation, uh, yellow books, uh, Qin Chung Chang, dirty virus infecting danger, and so forth. In this case, all these negative attribution may co all cumulatively contribute to shape the so-called Orientals as subhumans. 
However, I suggest that both sides, even if through apparently different ways, do jointly contribute to distancing, reification, and ultimately to the inevitable dehumanization of the so-called Eastern or Oriental other. It means that both sides built on an other process shaped by a dualistic contrast to hegemonic and usually uncritically assumed and therefore naturalized Western identity. This makes it very difficult to focus on isomorphism, convergence, commonalities, because the so-called Western paradigms of humanity are assumed to be universally valid, therefore contributing to the production of asymmetrical power relations and unequal social relations in terms of ethnicity or race. Okay. I'm finishing. Okay. I've already exceeded the time of my talk, so I'll be glad to finish here without adding my concluding remarks, which are actually very provisional, considering that the topic of my talk is still unfolding and changing. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thanks to you. Thanks to you, Toshio, and uh, apologies for having to um, cut you off. Unfortunately, this is my job today, uh, but I really hope that we can maybe uh, continue this uh, line of thought, maybe with some questions from the floor. If you could please stop sharing your screen uh, when you want so that we can see questions, maybe. I'll try to see if there's something in the chat. Wait. Thank you. Um, uh, one second. So uh, we have um, a question from uh, someone um, names, named Slimani, which I guess is a, a con condensed net name. Uh, we can, um, can we attribute the cause of the cultural racialization because of the corona pandemic to moral failure at various levels? And this is one. And then maybe Davide Orsito can also um, um, come in now and, uh, and ask his question for Professor Miyake. Hello, Professor. Thank you very much for your speech. Um, in fact, um, as, as someone recognizing with the Western society and also for, with the Italian citizenship, um, this presentation has given me a sort of, you know, healthy, a uh, feeling of shame and uncomfort. And I think that's supposed to be that. And I thank you for that because I mean, we, we need to be reminded that there are certain patterns that we really need to correct. And that even if we think we are in uh, this society which has made a lot of progress, uh, progress sometimes uh, is lagging behind what we could do in fact. Um, I wanted to bring the idea of racism into the framework of, uh, of the conference, that is the individualism and communitarianism discourse. So even after like 50 years of human rights narrative where, where individuals are at the center, um, I think that a big backlash of this might, might be, of course, I mean, the lack of community. And this lack of community can come um, in the most vicious of forms, which is racism, of course. I mean, it's racism is basically the hatred towards the other. And I mean, I wanted to know from you what would you think would be a solution in in a world in which uh, the individual has been uh, has been brought up as being the protagonist, but still there are some leftovers of of this community that seem to be sort of primitive somehow. I mean, with all the things you said, I mean, they they seem to me like very. Um, very primitive and visceral, I mean, as feelings. And what, what would you uh, recommend as a solution to this? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, should I try to uh, answer uh, with the first uh, answer to the first question? Yes, I think, yes, if you could address yes, uh, both points it. and then and we'll see how far we get also with time and uh, that would be great. Attribute the cause of cultural racialization because of the corona pandemic to moral failure at various level. Yeah, so the issue, I, as far as I understand the question, is about moral failure, if there was a moral failure. Uh, I, I'm not sure if I understood the question well. And actually, I don't think that the issue is so much about a moral fa uh, failure, because uh, uh, I think there's one level that I start uh, tried to point out also during my presentation that is the institutional level. I mean, uh, the so-called moral just level, which uh, you can see every kind of politician 
uh, trying to accuse uh, this or condemn these attacks. Uh, so this is, uh, you, can, you could see this kind of, 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 of level and which of course is related also the uh, constitution is also uh, related to what most politicians, politicians especially the populist pol politicians would call a decent way of thinking. But this does not uh, mean that you don't have this kind of very deep-rooted uh, social stigma, which uh, has very different effects on the micro level of everyday uh, living. So I think that it's quite difficult to put it uh, on the macro level because uh, I can imagine that most of these people who attack or insult uh, uh, Chinese or other people. Uh, they go to church, they feel Christian, and, 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 and so they, 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 they try to obey to, to, to this kind of institutional formal level. But then we have also what really happens on the everyday basis. And I'm more a cultural anthropologist, so more uh, curious about what happens uh, on this micro level. And the second question by Davide of Cito, uh, so the, the issue of racism and how it relates to uh, liberal or individual and versus the uh, communitarian divide. I think that uh, racism is not necessarily related to communitarianism. I think it's something that uh, came, comes before, and it's for me, it's not the issue of racism. Uh, it's more about uh, collective identity. Uh, racism for me is a part of um, more fundamental pillars of identity, which we call today civilizations in the modern age, like the West, or I can say the East. And when, for example, people think or use the term West or Western identity, it would not divide between a communitarianism or liberalism. It's the same part, I mean. And I think that the so-called Western identity is still uh, one of the most deep-rooted ways of creating identity, not only at the civilizational uh, um, level, but it goes down. Western identity, the so-called Western identity is made of different intersecting parts. It can be racial issues, of course, whiteness, it can be nationness, it can be universalism, it can be a lot of paradigms which contribute to create this idea of Western identity, but it's very, very rarely addressed. Everybody uses the West without quotation marks, it's a kind of what I call a blind spot. And this kind of blind spot actually for me is a process, it's a hegemonic process, which also causes rentalism, which causes also many different ways of creating identity and authority. So I think uh, it's not that uh, racist uh, are, are, are primitive or are bad. I think racist is a very uh, modern product. So. Uh, the question, uh, what are the solutions? <laughs> I don't have the solution of this. I, I'm no, more trying to analyze as, 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 a, as a scholar this kind of discourses and practices. But I think one thing could be not to feel ashamed, as David has said, it's not the issue of being ashamed, uh, uh, as I've heard by so many other persons. Uh, I, I think racial attacks were racial attacks, unfortunately, everywhere. But the issue is, at least as a scholar, to try to understand what the underlying assumptions are about our identity and how we relate to the other. So this is refers also to how we think about uh, the individual, of course, and how we think about uh, uh, communi community or communitarianism. So uh, thank you very, very much. Unfortunately, we do not have much time to uh, take other questions uh, because the whole schedule otherwise would be uh, transformed uh, or um, could not be um, um, up to, to, you know, to the time. So um, my role now is to thank uh, our speakers, first of all, and everybody else who participated to this great um, session. And um, I'm looking forward to hearing you again and to participate again. And thanks again to the organizers, Sofia and Volker. And um, that's it. I think I um, should close now. Thank you very much.
Bye. Thank you very much, everybody. Uh, I think we'll take a 15 minute break. It lasts if we can be back here by four, at the four Italian time at the latest. So on the hour, let's say. Okay, thank you. Thanks to you. Using the same link.
Hi, Fulker, are you there? Yes, I'm there. <clears throat> okay, I think we can. Okay. Uh... Shayla, are you there? I'm here. Okay, great. I'm not wearing great. headphones for the time being, but I'm here. Well, I... I just wear them because my computer audio is so bad. Um, okay, so um, okay, so let me so so. Um, uh, it, Marina Caloni was supposed to chair the session of Shayla, but uh, she was called by Prime Minister Conte uh, for a meeting by the Scientific Committee, which is supposed to bring Italy out of a state of emergency. So oh, she's nice. excusing herself, and therefore I will chair this meeting. Okay. So let me just say, of course, everyone, you, you know, Shayla, she is uh, Eugene Mayer, Professor of Political Science and Philosophy at Yale University, and she's uh, teaching now also at the Columbia Law School. And uh, she has published many books, which you, uh, you know, just to say, Dignity and Adversity. And the last one has been Exile, Statelessness and Migration, Playing Chess with History from Hannah Arendt to Isaiah Berlin. And today she's going to talk about democracy, science and the state, reflections on the disasters of our time. Sheila, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much, Volker. It's a pleasure to be here in the presence of uh, old, um, old friends. I have a question to Sophia about the translation before I start. Sophia, I gave you the paper. Is it being yes. translated simultaneously? Because what? I will make some cuts. Oh, the translation, uh, I wrote a quick message. The translation is foreseen for the panel, the round table, which will come, which you will be a part of, of course. Um, but it's not going to be on right now. Oh, okay. Okay. Very good. All right. So I can, okay. Um, I have, um, written an essay partially to clean my head as the colloquial expression goes in English and I want to share my reflections with you no PowerPoint nothing I'm going to read uh, through an essay. According to historians of antiquity cataclysmic events such as plagues, floods, earthquakes, fires and constellations of stars were signs for the end of empires and civilizations. These were moments when Kronos and Kairos met, when the numerical passage of time, Kronos, was a sign for some more momentous transformation occurring in human life, and Kairos ruled over Kronos. Is the global pandemic caused by the COVID-19 one such moment for our civilization then? Certainly there are good reasons to think so. All of a sudden, the world seems to have shrunk because the virus is everywhere. At the same time, we're all quarantined in our private spaces. As the electronic media, such as the internet, Zoom, FaceTime, Instagrams, uh, Skype, overtake forms of communication, the public sphere is emptied out. Concert halls, theaters, and movie salons are empty, while parliaments are debating whether they can deliberate and hold votes over Zoom, which in fact they have started to do. Our workplaces are being radically transformed and the line separating the public and the private is being erased in favor of an expanded private sphere. As the home becomes a virtual office, for which you need no more than a good internet connection and a functioning computer, the private is once more reuniting productive functions in the economy with reproductive ones. Care for the body, the daily needs of life, and the raising and nurture of children are now intermingled in home home work offices. Yet the rise of the virtual workplace at home is unlikely to change the gender-based division of labor that is the care for the body and the young that have been and continue to be women's role. Women and working mothers have been doubly burdened by this pandemic and the shift of the balance between the private and the public. 
under the heading Democracy, Science and the State, Reflections on the Disasters of Our Time, I want to think through uh, this morning some of the most salient aspects of this moment. I will do so by going back uh, for uh, just a few minutes to Thomas Hobbes. Obviously, Hobbes has been on our minds. Michael Walzer yesterday also began by going back to Hobbes. And this is no uh, coincidence. I will return to Hobbes not because I agree with him, quite to the contrary. I radically disagree with him, but I think that Hobbes shows very clearly how and why the social contract on which the modern state in the West has been based is in trouble and why it has to be radically transformed. So let me begin with one of the most famous quotations from the Leviathan. And Sophia was going to put this up on, in chat uh, for the sake of the students. Nature writes Hobbes in the very first pages of the Leviathan, 1651, is by the art of men, as in many other things, so in this also imitated, that it can make an artificial animal. For seeing life is but a motion in the limbs. Why may we not say that all automata have an artificial life? For by art is created that great Leviathan called a commonwealth or state in Latin civitas, which is but an artificial man, end of quote. Ops's view that human life is but a motion in the limbs is indebted to the mechanistic natural sciences of his time. Hobbes, like Rene Descartes and Pierre Gassendi and other contemporaries of early modern science, believe in a materialist science of bodies in motion and attempted to explain all complex phenomena such as human passions and emotions in terms of two simple uh, forms of motion, desire towards the object and repulsion away from the object. There are many gaps and ellipses in this ambitious project of an early materialist program, which attempts to explain the rise of consciousness and speech out of such simple motions in the body, but it fails. However, the belief that human consciousness can be imitated and in some forms even self-generated by machines, by computers and intelligent machines is central to all the ventures that are known as AI, artificial intelligence in our times. In that sense, Hobbes is both passé and yet strikingly contemporary because he began this ambitious project of trying to imitate human consciousness and intelligence via the artificial machine. By teaching that life is but emotion in the limbs, science also demystifies the folly and superstition of those who believe in ghosts, spirits, and other creatures. This is the enlightenment function of modern science. Since there is no sumum bonum, it is irrational to want to, it is rational to want to avoid the sumum malum, which is death. Particularly for Hobbes, the fear of violent death in the hands of another is the worst evil. Fear of death is a complex emotion that combines a naturalistic psychology, all animals fear death, with a more stoic philosophy of recognizing that in the face of death, we are all equal. It is thus for Hobbes vanity to try to establish earthly precedence over another by duels and other such activities of aristocratic societies. The state, the Commonwealth is there to preserve life and to enable, quote, desire of such things as are necessary to commodious living and a hope by their industry to attain them. Right? So the state is there to guarantee both the hope to attain commodious li living 
and that one can do so by one's labor. The good life is the life of comfortable, commodious living and striving to achieve those commodities that will satisfy men's desires. A momentous transformation in the Western philosophical tradition is taking place here. When the good life is no longer viewed as the life of doing just and noble deeds as it was for Aristotle, or as the life of Christian virtue and devotion as it was for Saint Augustine, but rather the good life is defined as the life of individual satisfaction, consumption and avoidance of death. By teaching that life is but emotion in the limbs, Modern science enables the bourgeois individual of early capitalism to align his passions for consumption and commodious living with rationality. The modern social compact whereby we give up our so-called natural liberties that have supposedly led to the war of all against all is based on the promise that the modern state will preserve life and enable comfortable existence through the pursuit of market liberties. The sources of Hobbes's well-known authoritarianism are rooted in this belief that as long as the sovereign can guarantee a peaceful existence and protect the subject's life, the pursuit of all higher goods, such as the good life of ethics and politics as defended by Aristotle or a life of freedom of equals living with one another as equals under the law as defended by the Roman civic Republican tradition, all these visions are irrelevant. Now, all the elements of this modern social contract have been transformed in the intervening centuries. And let me add here, I'm just following Hobbes. I don't believe in the social contract in that sense, nor in the state of nature, but I'm just following Hobbes's reasoning here. So in what ways have these elements been transformed? First, the mechanistic and reductionist concept of science defended by Hobbes has long been replaced by a model of epistemic interdependence in which the very presence of the scientist observing or testing objects affects their positionality and properties of the bodies. Bodies don't just move in space, but their very presence to each other alters these properties. This seems to be the lesson of quantum physics, but more than Heisenberg's principle of uncertainty. There have been tremendous epistemological transformations here. Furthermore, the long history of our attempt at mastering our external environment has created a new era for humans on Earth, the so-called Anthropocene. At least since the Industrial Revolution, human activities have irreversibly impacted natural processes, including the habitat of plants and animals on the Earth's surface. In the years to come, we may be able to reduce the human footprint on nature somewhat, but it is too late to reverse global climate change. Second, the tremendous expansion of human productive capacity over the years is indebted to the application of scientific and technological advances to the production of commodities. Our modes of production, be they under capitalist, social democratic, or status capitalist regimes like China, are based on the yoking of scientific knowledge to market forces. The limitless pursuit of commodious existence, which has now encompassed the globe in infinite supply and demand chains, serves not only the satisfaction of desires, but it is also the transmission or belt for deadly viruses of which COVID-19 is only the latest version. Remember AIDS, SARS and Ebola. We are the beneficiaries as well as victims of our global greed and consumerism. In the third place, global economic expansion and the preservation of our health and life are now in contradiction and will be for some time to come. This cruel virus thrives on human contact 
and presents us with the impossible choice between economic survival, human sociability, and maintaining oneself. Whether or how so-called deglobalization will occur is an open question. I personally doubt that there will be uncouplings from the global economy. We are just too interdependent. Under these conditions, the state is neither the guarantor of life against death nor of an expanding economy. At its best, the state's task is crisis management under conditions of extreme and growing uncertainty. The distinction between science and ethical and political choice so familiar to Max Weber reasserts itself. Scientific measures tell us about the infection rate, the mortality rate, or the rate at which infections are progressing. But what they cannot tell us is what level, what percentage, or what rate of infection are acceptable to various human communities. Nor can science tell us what kinds of ethical considerations should govern triage decisions in emergency rooms. The global pandemic has increased our reliance on scientific technocratic rationality while revealing its fundamental ethical limits. While in the US, I'm afraid that we have entered the age of the counter enlightenment, when scientific truths are manipulated and repressed such as to distort mortality and infection numbers, and lies are spread about the properties of supposed medicines such as hydroxychloroquine, responsible political leadership should deny that there is a silver bullet to help us resolve the unavoidable and painful trade-offs between work and health, opening the economy, and avoiding the spread of the pandemic. Let me make one final observation about why the Hobbesian picture of human nature and Hobbesian anthropology are so wrong. One of Hobbes's most famous lines is, quote, let us consider man as if but even now sprung out of the earth and suddenly like mushrooms come to full maturity without all kind of engagement to each other. But as feminists have pointed out, this picture of men as mushrooms is completely false, precisely because mushrooms are connected with each other under the earth through an elaborate system of tubular roots. Okay? There is no individuation without interdependence. The image of men as mushrooms uh, to reach maturity without the help of others who nurture and care for them is a fantasy of early bourgeois men. It is an ideal of autonomy without attachment, freedom without mutuality. This illusion is or ought to have been over, though we see from the actions of some of the anarchist as well as right-wing anti-statist movements that this vision of autonomy as autarky, self-sufficiency, has a political hold on our present moment. And here we reach the question of democracy in our times. It is a widely shared observation that the corona pandemic has aided in the further consolidation of authoritarianism in countries such as Hungary, Poland, Singapore, India, Turkey and Brazil, while enabling the tightening of power in the already existing autocratic regimes of China and Russia. Hobbes would not have been surprised at these developments. The question is, what will be the impact of this pandemic on democracies? Already before the pandemic, many scholars were writing about the death of democracy Lewitsky and Ziblatt's very well-known book translated into many languages, or uh, David Ransomman's equally popular book, How Democracies End. So is the pandemic simply going to hasten a process of decline of democracies already in motion? 
the most challenging issue for democracies is to distinguish between the legitimate public health concerns of our day and illicit grabs of power through manufactured states of emergency. This is not an easy line to, do, to draw. Giorgio Agamben found himself in a very embarrassing situation because of an early article he wrote called The Invention of an Epidemic, in which he questioned the very necessity of doing so. At that early point in the development of the pandemic, the article was written in February, Agamben cited a discredited report of the National Research Council to the effect that, quote, there is no SARS-CoV-2 epidemic in Italy, but only an infection that causes more aggravated flu-like symptoms, and in some cases, pneumonia. Agamben asked, if this was the case, then why would authorities spread utmost panic and limit liberties in such drastic fashion? As you know, this generated a big and scandalous uh, debate and Agamben was clearly wrong in his understanding of the scientific situation. And since then he has recanted and corrected himself. But he made two points, which I think we should take seriously. First, he claimed that there was a tendency, quote, to use a state of exception as a normal paradigm for government, end of quote. Second, he argued that the state of fear again feared, in recent years has evidently spread among individuals and translates into an authentic need for situations of collective panic, the prevalence of fear and the tendency to collective panic. The epidemic he claimed became an ideal outlet for the expression of collective panic. Now, don't misunderstand me. I have always rejected Agamben's wild generalizations that see in the concentration camp the paradigm structure of modernity or that postulate that liberal societies are based on a structure of violence which hides behind the veil of the rule of law until that, those moments when that veil is torn asunder and the hypocrisies of liberalism reveal themselves. I don't accept any of that. Nonetheless, I think that both his observations about the emergence of the state of exception as a normal mode of government and the spread of fear and collective panic are connect, correct and need to be taken seriously. Writing in year four of Trump's America and from my home in the mountains of Western Massachusetts, where I have been sequestered for eight weeks, let me make some observations about why Agamben's point seem so plausible to me. Even the language that is being used frequently to describe quarantining oneself, it, such as sheltering in place, sheltering in place, is infused with a vocabulary of securitization and quasi-militarism. Who or what are we sheltering ourselves from? This phrase became common in the United States after massive sh school shootings and its continuing usage testifies instead indeed to the collective fear and panic that is pervasive. Expressions describing COVID-19 as the Chinese virus are attempts at creating new enemy images and to, per to perpetuate the sense that we are in a state of war. And Toshio before me has talked about the spread of anti-Chinese, anti oriental racism. But if one is at war, then the government has the right to demand extraordinary powers. Perhaps to me, the most shocking blow to democratic government and the danger came from the Board of Election in New York, which in a decision that has since then been reversed by the State Supreme Court of New York was ready to cancel the New York State primary is scheduled for June 23rd with the argument that under conditions of the pandemic, court New Yorkers could not afford a beauty contest. This was Governor Cuomo's face, 
praise among the candidates of the Democratic Party, namely Biden and Bernie Sanders, okay? And this in a democratic state, simply you just cancel the primary. Thank God the court reversed it. Since then, attempts to prevent voting by mail in ballots has become a major issue for the Republican administration that is trying to prevent it by all means possible with the openly public and cynical argument that mail-in ballots may favor the Democrats rather than the Republicans. If elections can be brazenly canceled by local officials and proper voting, mail ballot voting is hindered by the United States president, then indeed liberal democracies are on their way to becoming autocratic. But let me return to the hard question. What about the hard question that is preoccupying people and governments everywhere? For some time to come, and until a vaccine has been invented and is available on a mass scale, we have to reconcile the necessary public health measures with restrictions on our freedom and civil liberties. How can we do so without endangering the future of liberal democracies? First, we need public vi vigilance against any public safety measure that is passed without what is called a sunset clause, by which I mean any administrative action or legislation which does not specify when and under what conditions it can be ended. If such emergency measures are passed without specifying when and how they would end, indeed the state of emergency becomes the state of exception. Second, we must distinguish between peaceful and safe expressions of political dissent and gatherings and those which are there to incite and encourage violence. I know this is a very rough line but it is possible to hold demonstrations while maintaining safe distancing. In the United States in particular, this is very difficult to do because of the second amendment which permits the ownership and in some states such as Texas, the open carrying of guns that are legally owned. Already trends, however, are visible on the part of authorities, whether local or centralized to curb citizens' expressions of political views on the grounds of preserving public safety and order. To paraphrase Ivan Krestev, democracy cannot function if more than 50 people cannot be on the streets at the same time. There has to be a way to make this possible. Third, we must be attentive to the abusive use of surveillance technology such as cell phones and other devices that track and test individuals. I don't know how you feel about this, but I frankly get horrified when I see images of people in Singapore or South Korea being told on their cell phones what they have to do and where they are, et cetera. You know, we have to discuss this. Whatever speed and efficiency such measures may bring with them, the loss of privacy and liberty, which will inevitably accompany their use, is frightening. We may be enabling the state to become a surveillance machine. Big Brother is everywhere. Democracies cannot flourish under these conditions. Fourth, we have to mobilize against the culture of death and fear that is being spread all around us, whether it is by demonizing Asian people as virus carriers or stigmatizing refugees and asylum seekers who are themselves already suffering from the militarization and closure of national borders. The fear, passivity, distrust and misanthropy generated by the pandemic will need to be countered by generosity, solidarity, care and sacrifice. From the songs and arias sung by Italians on their balconies to the noise that er erupts every night in New York, Paris, London, Madrid, and other capitals between 7 and 9 p.m. to thank the health and essential workers, we know that it is not that easy to silence the voices of the people and our solidarity and hope. But all these measures will amount to nothing 
if the tremendous insecurity and precarity, to use Albina Osmanova's term, upon which contemporary capitalism and our economic rest are not transformed. Is COVID-19 then a moment signaling the end of our scientific, technical, commodity, and consumer-driven capitalism and its varieties? I think rather the pandemic is like an emergency break, which as you will recall, according to Walter Benjamin, it was the task of social movements to step upon the emergency break so that the engine of history would not crash in flames. The social contract, which was so clearly laid out by Hobbes between science, the state, and capitalism, needs to be fundamentally transformed. We need a science in the service of reversing the damages inflicted by the Anthropocene on the earth. We need economic production in the service of human equality and dignity. And we need a state in which the alliance between big pharma, big capital, and big data is harnessed instead for a new green deal rather than serving corporate greed. Okay, that's all, thank you. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Sheila. Um, I think there is a lot on the plate. There is a lot out there. So I open the floor to the discussion. You can either raise your hands and Sophia will notice that, or you can write into, uh, you can write into the chat or you can yeah just open your mic and your video and and ask a question directly okay who wants to go if i may sheila Giancarlo. I, it's very difficult it's very difficult to me to forgive you to forgive you your quotation of a gamble because uh, a set of articles you wrote about that, a long set of articles, not only one, uh, was such a, an um, idiocy in denying uh, the existence of a problem like a virus, a very aggressive virus, uh, uh, that uh, I would compare it to the nihilism of many politicians, not only Trump, but many politicians that became uh, instinctively the nihilist of the issue. So. Having said that, it's very difficult to rescue some useful concept in the Agamben uh, texts that they brought uh, later. Because if you if you if you uh, claim that uh, there is a danger uh, of authoritarianism, which is certainly something that can come with uh, as a, a good a good fellow. Of of uh, of the state of exception of the emergency, uh, but if you deny the existence of emergency, it's very difficult to give credibility to your uh, to your uh, warning about this danger. You know, this contradiction is too big to avoid this uh, contradiction. This. I, I, I hear you, Giancarlo, and I mean, I'm no fan of Agamben. The reason why I picked this up is because it is uh, provocative. And I do think that the, we need to try to make a distinction between the state of emergency and the state of exception. Of course, what he said at the beginning was garbage. And I have read this discussion you know, where people like Jean-Luc Nancy and others have argued against them. But the distinction that I'm trying to make is between the state of emergency and the state of exception. Nobody is denying that there is a state, justifiable state of emergency regarding the pandemic. The question is, what is being done in the name of stopping the pandemic that is in contradiction to the rule of law and to the question of civil liberties. And uh, I think this is, this is a question that we all need to, to address, at least speaking from where I am now, okay, in the, in the United States, I see a creeping transformation of a democratic culture into a kind of authoritarianism 
And it is altogether possible, you know, if a local election board simply tries to cancel the election, then at that point we have made the transition from exception to emergency. Uh, that's, that's all that I'm getting from Agamben and also the, the point about this culture of fear and panic. Again, we have been living with this uh, uh, very seriously because of mass school shootings, children you know, who are now used to terms like shelter in place in the school. So for us in the United States, the COVID-19 pandemic is coming at a moment, I think, when public culture is really become in many ways a culture of death, Thanatos. So, you know, leave Agamben aside, maybe I should just like, you know, these points can be made independently as well, so. Yes, I understand perfectly. Your distinction between uh, state of exception is the end uh, an emergency, but once you open the door to a denial of a scientific evidence, you open the Pandora's vase of every possible conspiracy theory that everything has been invented by, at the same way when 9-11 was supposed to be invented by the uh, American power, by, by uh, uh, just to justify what has followed. Uh, you know, it's very difficult to prevent this uh, uh, slippery into the conspiracy theory. That's, that's why it is evident that these distinctions you made is very important. Let's say uh, uh, the kind of uh, application to, to trace uh, people movement uh, after just to prevent the further contagion has to have an end, as you, as you say very well. All these things have to have an end. Let's say the an app tracing people movements to discover contagion it could be, uh, could be, uh, could last three months, let's say four months, but it has to have an end. I, I agree with you. That's, uh, but that's why I would like to see your point uh, made stronger than weaker than with something that inevitably happen if you connect your, your, your uh, reflection to that one of a gamble. Uh, we, we have four more questions. Uh, we start with Sandro, then Albina, then Nadia, and then Jose. Uh, yes, um, Sheila, hi, and uh, uh, thanks for this uh, wonderful and passionate uh, uh, um, talk that you gave. I also share Giancarlo's point wholeheartedly about Agamben's total irresponsibility. It is to be rejected the whole way. I mean, also, uh, there are two points, I'll be more specific about that. Uh, but uh, there is a kind of, there was in his papers, uh, which were meditated papers, a paternalistic uh, downplaying of the fear that common people have of dying and therefore the propensity to obey the lockdown measures and playing them down from this aristocratic ivory tower and saying that they're, they're, they're prizing the bare life more than the real uh, full-fledged life that he supposedly or other like him are leading. That's a total, that's totally to be uh, rejected also on moral grounds. But you tried to rescue two points of him, uh, this confusion of state of exception and state of emergency and a general tendency to use the state of exception uh, paradigm and this tendency to collective panic. Both of these are not his own intuitions, the idea of government by emergency is there in the literature and um, think of Bruce Ackerman talking about, uh, uh, about uh, the last 20 years in the, in the book, uh, the, 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 the fall, the decline and fall on the American Republic about this continuous uh, playing of emergency on the terrorist side, on the economic side, or, the, or, the, or now the, the, uh, the, the health, uh, side. So always an emergency to be faced. And collective panic risks society by Ulrich Beck. 
is all about society being ruled by this fear of risk. So I mean, a gunman is even right there has not offered anything new, but I wanted to uh, uh, bring up one point that I really uh, liked in your, uh, in your paper, the, the idea that we have to think democratically and critically about emergency because emergencies are gonna be there even if you don't like that. And, uh, and there is again, uh, we don't start from scratch there. There's this idea that Ackerman, Bruce Ackerman elaborated in 2004 in, in the wake of the 2001 uh, terrorist crisis uh, with the Twin Towers with 9-11, uh, the emergency constitution. The idea being we think democratically how the emergency has to be handled. And the, and, and the three key points would be first, the mechanism for ending it. This was also stressed by Giancarlo. But that is that if it's the metaphor- what I said, with sunset yeah, rules. No? Yeah, sunset rules. The metaphor, the, the, the idea that he had there, and we need to perhaps think through, is that it has to be bipartisan or multipartisan. I mean, if you have a war, you cannot have a premium to executives. You have to be, uh, you have to have bipartisanship or multipartisanship. And the mechanism was that it has, it cannot be on the side of the executive only to declare emergency. It has to be to have validation by legislatures and 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 with super majorities of 60% then increasing up to two months to 70% then to 80%. So an escalating uh, 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 range of super majorities that would enable uh, the oppositions in the legislatures to veto the prolongation of prolongation of the emergency uh, at the initiative of the executive. That would be the main guarantee. The other one is balancing uh, the, the separation of powers. So information is key. And we've seen that with medical information now uh, with medical information, it's key uh, who uh, disseminates information and how valid that is in oppositions uh, that cannot be left up to the executive, uh, the executive's uh, uh, branch of government uh, alone. Uh, the emergency constitution has to provide for the opposition to have a say on that because so much of the credibility and political sensibleness of the, uh, of the measures that are taken depends on what you know. And so what you know cannot be left in the hand of, of those who govern alone. That, that, that would be the balancing mechanism that would make for a democratic emergency situation versus one that backslides back from democracy. And, and then we need some other, uh, some other stuff. I mean, that was in 2004 thought about terrorism. So indemnizing victims of, uh, uh, judicial abuse or judicial error, and, and now we need to think extra measures for uh, uh, for health measures uh, uh, that may be mistargeted or, uh, or or not working. But we could make that a task to democratically think what it means to handle emergency, given that it certainly is a restriction on freedom as usual, as a guarantee against the backsliding of democracy. But thanks again for your great talk. I mean, uh, Sandro, thank you very much for reminding me um, uh, of the, you know, that I should go back, you know, to Ackerman's, uh, to Ackerman's work on this. That is very, uh, very uh, helpful, and I certainly um, will do so. Uh, all I want to say right now is, as you know, uh, executive privilege takes a different form in the United States and in most parliamentary in most parliamentary systems. And so the, uh, you know, the uh, play of the parties you know, at the moment is basically restricted in Congress to these uh, economic, uh, economic uh, measures, okay? So in that sense, I think one has to, one has to look at the construction of uh, the balance between the executive and Congress in a parliamentary system, as opposed to our kind of, you know, presidential system, which is much more prone to abuses. But that's a that's a terrific reminder. Thank you. And look again, <laughs> I I know that by putting Agamben in this paper, I was going to provoke a discussion. I know that you know that everybody's like holding your red. Come on, you know who I am. But um, I particularly like your point. Uh, 
about this concept of bare life and his critique that modernity is about bare life. You know, I mean, he's a Hobbesian. He's a Hobbesian. And in the same way that many others, right, intellectuals now like David Ranciman and so on are evoking Hobbes against, against uh, democratic, democratic posture. So the, this idea that modernity is simply based on the preservation, quote unquote, of bare life. You said it's a kind of aristocratic paternalist looking yeah. down. So what does he expect to do for people to commit suicide knowingly? Okay, that, I mean that's a that's a very troubled uh, troubled uh, analysis of modernity as as bare life. But if you begin with Hobbes, you know there is that that moment of truth to it. Okay, thank you, but you know, good to hear your voice. Yeah. Okay, so we have now Albina. Uh, thank you, uh, Sheila. It was. Um, very good to be reminded, and it's very important to remember that uh, the pandemic has exasperated tendencies that were already there before. And therefore, any attempt to normalization will bring us back to that condition that was not so great before already. But I think we, I would rephrase your diagnosis a little bit um, by way of actually trying to answer also the question of Mateus Dredge about how about Bolsonaro and all the uh, dictators who are uh, you know, in denial, uh, deliberate denial. So before the pandemic, um, we saw um, a rule that I have described as a politically responsive or sometimes even democratically responsive, but socially irresponsible rule. That is, the states were pursuing global economic competitiveness, giving sweet deals to, uh, like Ireland gave a sweet deal to um, Apple in order to secure employment, et cetera, et cetera. So it was pursuing certain policies, but without consideration of the social consequences of those policies. Um, so what we see now is two types of um, continuation of this socially irresponsible rule. One is rule through executive privilege. It is very easy just to uh, lock people at home uh, and it is just an extremely facile way of rule without considering the consequences of that. And the other is leave it to the market. You know, don't do anything. So these two seemingly contrasting responses to the pandemic in fact, are two modalities of the same political logic of ruling without considering the social consequences of that rule. Because what would it mean to rule in view of the social consequences? Right? What would be a socially responsible rule? Well, that would be a massive investment in public health care, in education, in, in, in thinking, not, not throwing paid, uh, uh, checks at people, right? not throwing money at individuals, not even thinking about equalization of resources, as now the, the, the left is so focused on inequality, but thinking about the public, you know, society as a whole, um, that, is, that is from me, so. Okay. Um, thank you, Albina. Uh, agreed. I, I, want to, I want to clarify something about what I said concerning science, because I, my God, I don't want to give the impression that you know, uh, I'm being skeptical or supporting the denialists, not at all. Uh, there is something very interesting happening though. In some left publications already, there is a discussion that is resurging about what we used to call the social studies of science, the debate about the social construction of science, you know, we know that in, uh, uh, you know, epistemology in the 90s and so on, there are huge debates about this. And right now, this is coming up, this is coming up again. Uh, this is not my, uh, my position. The position that I'm trying to make goes a little bit to, this, to the issue of the relationship between science and ethics. You say socially responsible, right? I mean, um, uh, we have to understand this paradox that Max Weber already laid on us. I mean, 
Angela Merkel can get up and say, look everyone, this is how the rate of the epidemic is progressing, therefore we can do this or that. But in a sense, there is no therefore. The therefore is, I am a trustworthy and responsible and rational politician, as opposed to someone like Trump exactly. or others. And because you have trust in me, okay, I can draw these ethical and political conclusions from the evidence that science is presenting me with. I mean, we have to be very, very careful about not sacrificing democracy for technocracy. You know, if we think that science simply gives us the answer, it doesn't. Right. Although th this does not mean I don't respect science, not at all, not at all. All I'm, all, you know, so what you call socially responsible judgment that shouldn't be left up to the market, but shouldn't also be left up, you know, to a technocracy. So what is the answer? Remember, you know, Habermas's very early essay, Science and Technology as Ideology, right? We are almost now back, back to, that, to that point. And the solution as always is the robust democratic conversation among the citizens, experts, scientists, and politicians. And there is no, there is no silver bullet. We're going to think and decide under conditions of uncertainty and in a risk society. And our assumption is that the more democratic and the more legally viable, rational the process is, somehow we are going to come up with acceptable, acceptable you know, answers, right? Mm -hmm. So. Okay. okay, good. Now we have now Nadia and then Jose, and then we have Basically, four other questions by, by by summer school participants. Um, well, I let, let's see how, how far we get. Let's start with Nadia. Hi, Nadia. Your comp your microphone isn't. I open. know. I know. This is now. So, hello, everybody. Hi. Uh, simply, I would like to try to make a, a leap outside of the. Um, of the um, Agamben uh, paranoia and add something uh, that can help us to uh, go back to the different conceptualization of politics uh, and the liberty that came out uh, during uh, this pandemic and the way in which governments have reacted. So I tried while I was listening to you, to, to all of you in some sense, uh, to um, make it a, a three kind of uh, reaction that I saw in, uh, in the globe. Reactions from governments and as they define and they, and they present us with different conceptions of political community or politics and thus liberty. So I'm a Aristotelian in this case. Um, first of all, I would call the first one um, the Robinson Crusoe one. I mean, the solitary individual uh, doesn't care anything about or nothing about the others, also because doesn't have a conception of a society to begin with or a community. And to this vision, practically, which is kind of free ride that I do what I like, who cares? Uh, this is an absurd because the assumption is that other people, uh, the other people should be instead very self contained and self regulated in order for you to be a free rider. We know about this uh, prisoner dilemma, but you see, you, see, you I could see this prisoner dilemma in all uh, uh, politicians or leaders like Bolsonaro, like Trump, uh, the, the early, the early um, uh, Johnson, the individualistic, rad radical, radical individualistic and so-called anarcho-liberalism. Uh, do what you like, uh, you are free, and then we saw together who knows how in, 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 in which way. This is one, which is a denial of a conception of liberty as living freely along with others with responsibility. So it's, uh, the second is despotic, uh, which is the uh, opposite and identical to the Robinson Crusoe because it is uh, alienating, uh, identifying all the individuals uh, forcing them into an obedience with no way of 
themselves presenting themselves as responsible. This is the, the despotic model. I mean, uh, you simply have to obey, full stop. There is no way out. And the state paternalistically takes care of you. I think that these two visions, they, what I call the anarcho one and the despotic one, are the opposite is identical because they presume no political interaction, either because there are uh, automistic selves or because there are no selves at all. So the third one is what we would call the civil liberty or, or as we know, we are shared with the constitutional democratic one. And in my view, when we speak, and for this reason, I think that Agamben is very similar to the Robinson Crusoe one. Very similar because they, it doesn't have any notion of, 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 of politics as, as the uh, economy of freedom, of liberty in the communal sense with the others. Liberty, it doesn't exist in his uh, the, uh, vocabulary. There is the political as the state, as the, the mechanism of power, exactly like in a uh, despotic or non one. So, does this, in my view at least, uh, this pandemia it showed us the specificity of the, of the practice and the conception of a liberty that is enjoyed with others within a constitutional democracy, no matter whether this constitution is more or less presidential or not. But truly, there are three scenarios here, and it's not, all, not the two scenarios, the West against the Chinese. No way. There are three scenarios in which, paradoxically, the Chinese is very combinable with the, uh, with the uh, hyper hyper libertarian one or the Bolsonaro one. And that's uh, somehow what uh, um, we can uh, think in this way is uh, that there is a way of uh, uh, facing uh, the exception within, without taking away politics, without taking away the condition of responsibility. And my view responsibility is very important here because when uh, Western states, like the European states, Italian, the Italian case, they use this uh, so-called uh, self-certification. You have to prove, you have to give your responsibility by signing if you want to go out for uh, specific uh, reasons of necessity. This is a call for responsibility that only in constitutional and liberal, liberal states or democratic states we have. And this is a way of uh, uh, underlying the moments of, in, of kind of individual making an exception to accept to the exception so that I need to go out because I have some needs and I certify that. This is an important way of participating inside of the politics of exception by recognizing that there is an exception to the exception. And this is something Nadia, peculiar Nadia. to our states. Sorry, I'm stopping okay. here. Good, because Thank we have you. also the round table afterwards where you oh, okay. uh, have also the opportunity to but probably I come that back to this But in relation to Agamben would be, would be interesting somehow. Absolutely. Sheila, we have now five to man 10 minutes to go and I have on the list uh, at least five to seven other questions. Now, how do we want to go? Do you want to respond to Nadia and then we collect quickly questions or? Probably you can respond oh, now directly because it's been a very long question. I think we will talk, you know, in the uh, populism democracy roundtable that comes. I mean, basically, Nadia presented an alternative conceptualization of the situation, uh, much of which I find very valuable. I don't see it as a criticism of what I was getting at. Maybe it's a it's a parallel conceptualization. We don't we don't uh, disagree. So let's take the other questions. Okay, let's take Jose. And okay, I'll be very brief. Uh, thank you, uh, Sela, for a really, really uh, uh, insightful presentation. I agree basically with everything you've said. So my question is really about the emergency breaks, uh, uh, the image, and the need to think and to act beyond national democracy. I was concerned yesterday of in our discussion of Walser and Macedo that if we only think in those terms, not all of these challenges are global, whether we are talking of the Anthropocene, whether we are talking of the global pandemics, whether we are talking of immigration refugees, 
and even the big pharma, big state, big um, data. All those things are global challenges that no single national democracy can really, really address, not even the hegemon of the United States. So we need to think and to act transnationally and to think of democracy beyond the nation state. Otherwise, simply there is no, no way of addressing these global challenges. Thank you, Jose. Completely, completely agreed. I mean, there is a there is a simple phrase that sometimes is used by that is, if one person is sick, we're all potentially sick, right? I mean, that's a, that's a kind of it's a kind of paradox that you know is going on here. We can't even wrap our brains around it, right? And what's happened uh, uh, under this condition is what you know Jim Scott calls seeing like a state, right? All that impulse has come has come out, and maybe we can have a discussion of both the necessity and yet at the same time um, the absolute absolute sense that we both we have also to both criticize and somehow uh, confirm uh, the, uh, the, the state. I mean, that's a, I'm trying to get at this, at this question and this is just, you know, just. Uh, yeah. I mean, my main concern is if you look at the, at the response to the, to the, to the um, pandemic, it has been purely nationalist everywhere, including in the, the European Union, suspension of the borders. Absolutely. I mean, basically suspension of the area of Schengen and each country taking purely single initiatives against the others without communication, even within the European Union, we've returned to a purely autarkic nationalist model of the state. And absolutely, absolutely. I mean, territorial nationalism has reasserted itself and I've you know, written something else on the Schengen territorial nationalism. And the paradox is that <laughs> this is not what this, moment, uh, the, what this moment calls for, that in fact, the most effective measures are you know, um, at, the, at the local level, not at the container theory of the nation state, right? There's an interesting dialectic here between uh, the local and the global that we need to think about at the level at health. Okay, thanks. Okay, uh, next we have Mattels. You want, I think you wrote it in the, you Sorry, wrote it somewhere. Sorry, we first had one from Stanislav and then Mateus in reality. Okay. That's the order. I think like two more, then I think we should come to an end so that we have enough time also for the round yeah. table afterwards. Parker, why don't you read the questions two at a time? Because I can't follow the chat right now. Uh, probably, I Sophia, have, uh, who, who you followed the chat a little bit, can you do us the yep. favor to I have the them questions? both in front of me. Okay. Okay, so from Stanislav, he asks, my sense is that democracy will not die, but it will limp on while the space will continue to grow between the normative state and the pragmatic state. For example, the Eurogroup violating the sovereign self-determination of a member state by restructuring the Greek economy or the American federal government abdicating its responsibility to coordinate the distribution of PPE among states. How long will democracy limp on? Will we know when it collapses? And from Mateus, he asks, um, I see you analyze deeply the secular securitization measures in the US as they are being used as instruments of authoritarianism of authoritarianism and restriction of democracy. Also, you argue there's a, there's a use of the pandemic to make people fear the virus and implicitly accept the exception state in vigor. But that but that aspects, these aspects are mainly north north global concerns. I want to ask you how you analyze situations like Brazil's when the most important authorities in office deny even the existence of the virus or its gravity, as they want the society to risk their lives and go back to work to maintain stakeholder profits high. And he refers to a recent speech by Jair Bolsonaro. You want to go with another one or? Sure, sure. let's take another one. Let's just hear what's on people's mind, yeah. Okay. Uh, from, so. Okay, from Jaime. Uh, he asks, uh, regarding the use of social media and how mass surveillance, surveillance penetrates our life, while the existence of surveillance and lack of privacy is an alarming issue of our times, 
election interference, customized consumption, promotion, etc. The advantages of these technologies and its use to tackle crisis such as COVID-19 are undeniable, even if under authoritarian states such as China. Could you perhaps comment on the relevance of surveillance technology for risk management or used for social progress? Okay. One, one. Uh, I mean, um, uh, Nadia made a very helpful point when she referred, I, I don't know where she is now, when she referred earlier to this um, uh, uh, anarcho vision of the Robinson Crusoe, you know, method of, you know, sort of dealing with it. Look, Brazil is an extraordinarily upsetting and insane uh, case in that, in that respect. And I think that uh, this idea of the kind of macho individualism, this idea of autonomy is autarky that I talked about in my lecture, um, a along with along with denialism, along with scientific denialism, is there, and uh, it is going to ravage uh, ravage society. And I was very interested in hearing the colleague from India uh, who spoke before, Ananya, because Ananya was also making a point about countries in the global south, and we don't yet have enough information about this. She said, uh, surprisingly, uh, despite the behavior of the government, which is like the exact opposite of, you know, Brazil, that the Indian government clamped down much more authoritarian fashion, she said, the, the virus did not um, lead to as many deaths as in as in other you know uh, cases, and she commented on the demographic composition of the population. Right? I don't know this, the the numbers. How many people, let's say, in India are under the age of you know eighteen or between eighteen and twenty five, and what demographics may have to do with the situation in Brazil versus India? In other words. Can Brazil and you know get away uh, with uh, these incredibly reactionary measures because of some kind of you know uh, demographic uh, demographic composition, um, and uh, uh, you know so uh, the 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 final question about surveillance uh, surveillance technology. I, I I just I just am not I don't know how one can make this trade off. I mean, um, I know that Abishai is here, so I'll say at the beginning in Israel, okay, uh, the government started also using cell phones because the pandemic was especially by, by among Hasidic communities who live in very close quarters and will have to pray, et cetera. And there was the use of cell phone technology and it may or it may not have Led, uh, it seems to have stopped, but in general, I, I mean, these are very hard trade-offs and maybe you can say in that case, uh, the use of surveillance technology with a sunset clause, limiting it at, at this point in time for a but otherwise, uh, uh, you know, there's already a literature on surveillance capitalism, maybe Maybe you know the uh, ship has left the harbor, and all my ethical concerns about privacy, um, civil liberties, uh, may just be passé. I see Craig shaking his head about this, but um, I really do fear uh, the spread of the surveillance technology, uh, and uh, would only accept it for very, very, very limited uses. Okay, thank you, Sheila. There are some more questions in the chat, if you like. And I think that some of the participants are going to mail you uh, their questions or their comments. Uh, so at this point, I would like to thank you for this very nice talk. And we continue now with the round table. Sophia, can you just give some indications? Go. Are we going with a five minutes break or are we going um, straight ahead? Yes, would it be okay if we just had took a five minute break so I can set up the interpretation rooms? A uh, quick note to all who are here, interpretation will be available for the round table to Italian. Zoom does not provide an Italian 
option. So to hear the Italian, please click on French. <laughs> Which Everyone's is Everyone's still Italian evolving. After all, you know? You know, yeah, exactly. So um, thank you so much. And we'll see you all back here in uh, at uh, 5.15, so in five minutes. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you, me. everyone. Five minutes. Okay. Uh, Volker, I just thought of something. Since I just spoke, maybe I shouldn't be the first on the panel. Let so the others... panelists, we 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 as we gather the panelists now, right? Uh, so so on the program, let me see. Just let me open the program, Shayla. So on the program, you are yeah, you are with uh, Shayla, Craig, Avishai, Avishai and, and Nadia. Nadia. Uh, Why don't so... I go last? Because I already talked. Okay, and I'll go, I'll go last, okay? So, so okay. do we go then, Craig, Avisai, Nadia, Sheila? I don't yeah. like the order of males first, but... Um... <laughs> you can go also with Nadia first. You can have Nadia first, it's okay, but I think... But you Avisai, do I mean, you know, I'm you? just, uh, whatever you yeah, decide. Okay. Who would like to go first? Nadia, do you like to go first? Anyhow, how, how much time do you want to give yourself for the initial presentations? I already yes. said what uh, you, <laughs> because I thought that we are already in the round table. And so I <laughs> oh, thought no. that I to go on. So practically, oh, I... <laughs> you know, it's very, it, was, it was simply, uh, simply be, uh... because it was 4.45, uh, the time for the round table, I thought, oh my God, I'm late. And so they, we, have, they were we, have 70, we have 75 minutes. So yeah, right. give yourself maximum 10 minutes each maximum. And then, We'll have a conversation between you and then open for discussion. Okay. So who starts? Two more than ten minutes, please. Should I start? Uh, should I start? Uh, yeah, I think you can oh, start. Okay. So very few then notes about the fortune and uh, future of populism, so called, uh, in the pandemia situation. Wait, Nadia, right? Nadia, Wait. Nadia oh, there oh, is oh. A, there's a short break until We're a, in a quarter short past. Break. Okay, then we'll yeah, break. we are we are here discussing among ourselves. The structure, the procedure. Ah, okay. Now let me let me say hello to all of you, to all the panelists. Craig, oh. Abisai, when, Nadia, when when you last, you, last met, so uh, when uh, you be nice to be together, but let's begin in some official way because when you start speaking, that roundtable will be recorded and will be available in streaming yeah. forever, forever. <laughs> yeah, so you, forever. you let me know when to start. Think about. I can do the one minute break. break. <laughs> okay, two minutes break and then we continue. Giancarlo. Giancarlo, can, I assume that I don't need to introduce the panelists. They are well known and I don't need to introduce them, right? Uh, uh, very shortly, very shortly. With well, <laughs> prominent political scientist, prominent philosopher, prominent. Okay, okay, uh, good. Uh, let's say you have Sheila, there's Nadia. Uh, Craig and, and Avisai. Yeah. At least the affiliation, Yale, Yale, Columbia, and Avishai, uh, um, 
Avishai, so many books, I don't know. Right. Uh, choose the... It will take five minutes for each of them. That's up to you, yeah. We have, I think, the Tastula, the, wait, one hour and 10 minutes, one hour and, and, and 10, and one, one hour and 15 will be enough. Yes. So up to you, then. If you keep it in, in uh, inside one hour, it would be great. You mean the, the discussion? Then, then will come your session later on. Yeah, I know we are behind, but uh, mm -hmm. but I can cut my own session. Can be cut. You know. Yeah, the many, many turns, you know, if possible. But, Okay. It's for us to, to give the... Do you think we can start now? Because we said until a quarter yes. past, it's now 16, yes. we can start. Yeah. Yeah. And then yes. If there is Sophia, Sophia, is everything okay with the translation? Uh, yes, I, I think so. So Let when, when small care is beginning is the moment when it has to be recorded and to, to keep recorded online. Okay. Can the translators, I'm on the channel, uh, can they give me just a quick yes? Okay, I think that now we are all the panelists. Yes, I can. Uh, Wonderful. Sheila is coming on board. Steady. Sheila is coming. Go, Jose. Okay, uh, it's good morning here in the United States. Obviously, good afternoon in Europe and good night in India. Uh, it's a great pleasure to have the honor to chair this panel on reshaping politics between populism and solidarity. We have a very distinguished group of panelists. Uh, I don't need to introduce uh, uh, all of them. We'll go in the order. Nadia Urbinati, political scientist at Columbia University, who has been working on populism for many years. Uh, Craig Calhoun, a, a distinguished professor at uh, Arizona State University in Tempe, has been president of every possible institution, Social Science Research Council, uh, London School of Economics, Peregrine Institute, Avisai Margali, a prominent uh, retired philosopher uh, uh, from Israel for many years at the Institute for Advanced Studies at Princeton, and uh, last but not least, Seila Ben Habib, a very well known uh, distinguished uh, professor of philosophy, political theorist, feminist scholar, uh, cosmopolitan thinker, uh, a professor at Yale University. So without further ado, each of the panelists will have 10 minutes for brief introductory presentations. Then I will try to provoke some conversation among them, and then we'll open the floor for discussion. So Nadia, you go first, please. Well, thank you so much uh, for having me here. And um, so let's see um, what, whether I can uh, put uh, in few words what I really would like to strongly to talk about with all of you. Um, the question of populism, well, we don't want to go through a definition here because it's a, there is no time and place to do so, but at least one important element should be emphasized in order to talk about it in this situation, namely that at least we should agree, and I think this is important, that populism is a phenomenon internal to democracy and it can stretch the democratic constitution to its limits. And during this pandemic, we saw those limits stretched in several cases. One is the most important and uh, radical one. It's the Hungarian one. Uh, Orban really stretched the constitution to the limits and made the parliament uh, uh, vote on its own suspension, which is something incredible in a democratic uh, constitution or uh, democracy. So it's possible in this case that populism goes truly beyond its limits. So having said so, a problem that emerged that interests me in the last uh, three months or so is the following. This has been interesting. Perhaps the pandemic, uh, I'm uh, rephrasing from uh, what I read here and there, perhaps the pandemic had or will have potentially, potentially undermine the primacy 
of politics and partisanship and put the primacy on science, on knowledge, competent knowledge, and this would be a good news for populism because this is a way of uh, making populism somehow subjected to these scientific uh, uh, new competence. Um, and thus, there is a good, in this sense, the future cannot be necessarily bad for this reason, because, um, because we saw an emergency of uh, competence above politics. I think this is wrong, or I don't, I don't think it is, it is convincing. By the way, this was also one of the main uh, topic of the debates between uh, Rosa Ballon and, Sa and Chantal Mouffe uh, on the Chantal Mouffe on, uh, on Le Monde uh, recently. I think that in fact, for two reasons cannot be convincing. First of all, because what we call science and uh, we saw science in action, well, it's not a kind of uh, uh, beyond disputation science. In fact, there were medical, biological, scientific disciplines using algorithms sometimes, statistics some other times, and in the process of uh, uh, searching for a scientific knowledge of these viruses. So they shared, many scientists, biologists, epidemiologists, virologists, they shared with ordinary citizens their ignorance. And they sometimes uh, showed even contradictory uh, positions. So in some sense, uh, the, the populists, as many they said, as we interviewed so Salvini said, well, you know, the scientists are not more competent than you and me. So this cannot be a good news in for, um, for the disappearance of populism because they made their own friends scientists versus unfriendly scientists. We saw scientists divided between those who were in favor of keeping less open and those who were in favor of closing everything. So in this sense, it's not a good news. Second, it's not a good news for a reason that has to do, in my view, with politics in, in this sense, or political dem or democracy in this sense. There was an attempt uh, or a tendency within democratic theory uh, to consider, and I mentioned some names, Philip Pettit, you can sometimes also the, the uh, some, what, some, something that Rosan Ballon wrote, but other scholars, the uh, epistem epistemologists, so-called epistemic democrats, the idea that the, uh, the, uh, the way of saving democracy from itself or thus uh, from the risk of becoming so divisive, so partisan oriented, is to narrow the space and the domain of political uh, contestations and open and enlarge the domain of uh, impartial bodies of deliberation, autonomous bodies of deliberation, like, uh, like committees for decision-making or suggestion for decision-making, so as to take away from politics much of his myth, so-called, and to give it to competence. I think that the risk in this case is a very, um, un for me, an unappetible risk, because it is a way of debilitating democracy in the attempt to debilitating, to debilitate populism. And I think we don't want to do that. So in my view, does this is not the science, the science trajectory cannot be a good um, way to be uh, uh, pursued in order to find an alternative uh, to populism. And I want to conclude in this way uh, by, uh, by adding that if I have time, I, will, uh, I can uh, come. In fact, this pandemia um, made uh, political or democratic societies uh, in uh, react, I mean, it made them in um, somehow in a risky situation, but with a great opportunity. Meaning from now on, many of our society will face great decline of employment and uh, increased poverty and so on and so forth. Now, here is the problem. 
in this situation, if uh, uh, democracy is not capable of developing forms of social justice discourse and the organization parties in some sense and projects, then populism will have a prater in front of itself. In some sense, the argument made by by Habermas a few years ago, that the, the success of populism is the recognition of a decline of social democracy. I agree, I think is totally right. And in this situation, these, these uh, challenge, this risk can be uh, truly uh, verifiable and feasible because we, we, we will have millions of people in, uh, in a quest for intervention and it's not enough to give them some money in, in cash. It is important that democratic states have a project concerning public services and an organization of the job market that is not simply the neoliberal uh, market of taking a job no matter what. Uh, so it is a very demanding moment. And for this reason, both on the science domain and of the social issue domain, populists can be there uh, waiting for great uh, uh, growth instead of decline. I don't want to be so much pessimist, but this is the, the ball I like to roll now. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Nadia. Craig, you are next. Okay, thanks, Jose. Um, and thanks to uh, uh, Volko Giancarlo and all of the organizers uh, for this. Um, let me just make a few points about this. First, uh, populism is not essentially anti-democratic. It gets treated this way partly because it is dangerous to actually exist in democracies in our current context and others. Um, conspiracy theories, demagogues, and so forth um, create some of this danger and Populism is typically corrosive of institutions. So the paradox here is democracy depends on the institutions against which populism is corrosive, but populism is actually often an expression of democratic demands against those institutions, um, however um, problematically guided. What populism is crucially against in many cases not democracy, but Republican frameworks um, for constitutional democracy. It's really Republicanism that is the uh, perceived as the threat, um, whether articulately or not. Um, that is, Republicanism imposes limits on democracy, rules and norms, even the rule of law, um, that Democrats can um, can experience, populist Democrats can experience as limiting them. Um, they resent these rules and norms as well as the elites. Um, and we need to recognize how much Republicanism entrusts elites with leadership. And therefore, uh, there can be the populist grievances with elites who sometimes deserve it and sometimes don't. And we can be cursed with bad elites. And so in analyzing populism, we often look at the populists, um, if you will, at the followers at the so-called grassroots, um, or we look at the very peculiar extremes of international conspiracy theories, but we fail to look at the um, elites themselves. So in relationship to what Nadia just said, social democracy declined in considerable part because elites failed in their trust to care for the societies um, they were leading. Um, elites of the last decades allowed neoliberalism to dominate globalization and even globalism. So we face a very interconnected world. We need to think globally, as Jose was saying in the previous session, but this has been um, made problematic by the extent to which the dominant elites in almost every country um, accepted a broadly neoliberal frame um, and uh, um, accepted um, approaches to uh, globalization which failed to make it um, fairer and uh, uh, more readily 
um, embraceable by all populations and failed to provide care for those um, who had a difficult transition in it. Um, so this is an argument I've made in Reset and all before, but the problems with actually existing as opposed to elite or idealistic cosmopolitanism. Um, there have been major social transformations promoted by these elites and others, and they work better for them than for many others. So elites, often liberal elites, have not been in favor of inequality or in favor of deindustrialization or in favor of all of the you know, corporate power guiding globalization. But they have tolerated these partly because and visibly because they have worked okay for them. Their housing values have gone up. Well, they didn't say they were against um, a public housing arrangement. They didn't say they were in favor of homelessness, but they were quite happy to see the housing values go up and so forth. There has been radically intensified domestic inequality in all of the countries that were social democratic, some more than others. Um, and the elites have often embraced meritocratic illusions that legitimate their places. Well, they succeeded in exams. They went to the best schools. Um, they performed well. So meritocracy has become overwhelmingly um, a legitimation for inequality. Um, the elites also often embraced cultural and formal inclusion without material transformation of the social and economic underpinnings. So it's not that the cultural inclusion is in any sense bad, but that there is a real tension introduced by promoting it um, in tandem with meritocracy and without um, egalitarian or solidaristic social transformations. Therefore, it becomes crucial when we think of the French revolutionary triad of liberty, equality, fraternity, we need to embrace fraternity. Solidarity, we can say in less sexist terms. Solidarity has to mean not just a sentiment, but material integration, actually accomplishing the integration. What we see in many societies, in the US, in Britain, um, indeed in Brazil, in other places, is the weakness of the sense of being one country and in some sense in it together, whether in relation to the pandemic or other issues. Um, we see metropolitan cities connected to each other internationally more than to their national hinterlands. Um, so this demands a renewal um, of the nation, um, not just an acceptance or appreciation of old national identities institutions, but an effort to um, rebuild and transform. So renewing public service, renewing the institutional and other bases for integrating countries across regions, across classes, um, across ethnicities and races. Um, and therefore it does involve attempting to achieve national solidarity. Um, this need not be anti-global. Um, promoting international conflict has often been a tactic in domestic politics by populists, <coughs> by demagogues. But in fact, the national is integral to the transnational. There is no transnational without the national. Now we can imagine other forms of global order that are not based on nations, but we need to recognize how much strengthening transnational institutions today requires nations to behave differently, not abandoning nations. So I agree with Sheila, we must work through the national democracies, but we must also work to transform the national democracies, not just at the level of formal politics, but sociologically and economically as part of the cause of making nations more productive. This is necessary, um, not least because of the fact that national governments and very specifically transnational agreements are often the only um, capacity that exists to limit corporate driven, finance driven global capitalism. Um, the, um, there is not <clears throat> a ready mass democratic um, way of doing this. And um, if we separate too strongly the value spheres of politics, economics, and society, we come up with impotent political solutions 
in relation to what has become quite drastic economic power. Um, and we can think about the issue of surveillance capitalism that came up in the last session with Shayla and I wrote to everyone in chat. I agree completely with Shayla's concerns about privacy and trying to protect um, what amount to the Republican conditions for democracy um, and for good citizenship. But I also think we have to face how radically we have let surveillance capitalism come to dominate. That's it. Well, thank you very much, uh, Craig. And all of you are within time, self-discipline. Uh, next is Avisai Margali. Please, Avisai. Well I, well, I would like to actually address what Craig just raised, namely populism and solidarity in its current form. Populism has history, a, a checkered history, but I would like to talk about populism in its current form. One thing is common to populists from Modi in India and Urban in Hungary and Erdogan in, in Turkey and Netanyahu in Israel and Brexit, Johnson and Trump, of course, namely the claim of the populist, we are the people, speaking in the name of the people and trying to exclude others who are citizens, namely to narrow down the idea of citizens, be they the Muslims in India, the Kurds in Turkey, the Palestinians and the Arab Israelis in Israel, and I can go on and, they, and it's clear where it is heading. Namely, what the current populists are doing is undermining exactly the sense of fraternité in the French revolutionary triangle. Namely, narrowing down citizenship, the real full-fledged citizenship, to confine it to the ethnic dominant or to the dominant group in each country. So the populists speak in the name of the people and the question who is, who is, who is not in, among the people, who is not included. And, undermine, and by undermining the idea of citizenship, making the others, the immigrants, the foreigners, as at best tolerated. And actually, if we can get rid of them, it's even better. This, I think, is undermining this kind of solidarity that needed for citizenship. And I think that in that sense, this is what undermines democracy. The elite here, the populist element, the anti-elite element, comes that with a conspiracy theory. The elite tries to recruit those outsiders in its fold against their true people, the genuine, the nativist, the ethnic group, we the people. And the elite with those foreigners are conspiring. And it's not necessarily new. I mean, even, I mean, if you take urban in, in Hungary, this, the campaign against Soros, basically as a ruthless cosmopolitan, which used to be the euphemistic term for the campaign against Jews in the Zhdanov era in Russia. So the idea is basically to exclude and from the realm, from the public sphere, the outsiders. And the question, who are the outsiders? This struggle started already in the revolt and the counter-revolution in France. It was very 
it was manifested in the Dreyfus affair and in the Vichy, namely, as Moras said, that Jews, Huguenots, Freemasons, and foreigners are anti-French, anti-France. And the, and the populist, I think, are exactly on this line, namely the people, the true people, the authentic, the genuine, maybe the inarticulate, those, they are under attack, the way of life is under attack, but foreign elements that don't really belong. And, uh, and then you form, and then you put the others with sort of severe test of loyalties. You remember perhaps what used to be in England, the cricket test of Norman Tabit. He noticed, or he pointed out, that in a cricket game, cricket matches between India, say, and England, or the Bangladesh, Bangladesh and you know, the West Indies, the people that even if they were born already in the United Kingdom, the people who came from those countries side with a, so to speak, country of origin and not with England. And therefore they are not truly, they don't truly belong. So the whole idea, the populist streak is basically to exclude and create uh, the people and na uh, the nativist streak basically, I think, is very pronounced and very important here and it undermines simultaneously the solidarity needed for citizenship and democracy with it. I think I'll stop here. Thank you very much, Visai. Now we have two fantastic kind of the two sides of, of populism and democracy. And Sheila, is you, now you have the floor. Okay. Um, um, I'm very happy to be speaking after <laughs> Avishai because uh, he said so many things that I, I agree with. And I think we are going to have maybe a nice um, conversation here on the panel because I am, like Avishai, extremely skeptical about the promise of uh, populism. While I accept that populism, uh, the populist elements have been historically part of both left and right wing moments. But um, Craig said something very interesting when he talked about populism basically being against institutionalization and addressing fundamentally the role of the Republican, you know, of Republican institutions and also the Republican, Republican elites. Uh, but there is um, uh, something in the heart of populism, whether you look at left-wing movements in Latin America or the European variants, and I want to talk a little bit about Turkey to illustrate this. I think the, the contradiction in the heart of populism is the mobilization of the people against the elites who then get betrayed for another series of elites. In other words, uh, there is something about um, uh, uh, transcending the language of class in populism and yet ending up with results that are extremely class bound and that don't force the structure. So um, I want to uh, just take the case of Erdogan as an example uh, here, but um, I think it can be generalized. Uh, populism is a, a moment of disarticulation of democratic Republican institutions. It is based upon an identification of the majority of the people, supposedly the boundaries are never quite defined, with leader or leadership. It's a moment of vertical integration, okay, which appeals to a horizontal signifier, but it's vertically integrated. And as 
I wish I pointed out in this moment of identification with the leader, there is always a demarcation between those who authentically belong to the people and those who don't. So I think there is a romance about uh, the concept of the people that is used in some democratic theory, but maybe we should talk about here uh, the people, citizens, non-citizens, stakeholders. And I mean, uh, we, we should try to clarify this term because uh, um, uh, the danger of policing the boundaries of who belongs and who does not belong to the people is something that accompanies uh, populist movements. And I will make this claim about the gilets jaunes in France as well right now. And forgive me, you know, Chantal Mou's theory was mentioned. I think that very often she just simply skirts this question and does not even take up the issue of the boundaries of the demos, uh, meaning immigrants and others. Now, the contradiction that I see in the heart of populism, um, I want to illustrate with the case of Erdogan, okay? Erdogan, um, in uh, the initial years uh, of when the AK party came to power, spoke in the name of a different concept of the people than the exclusionary Kemalist Turkish nation. It was going to be a more inclusive concept of the people with the Kurds, the Armenians, the Alawites, a kind of Islamic internationalism that Erdogan was getting at. At the socioeconomic level, Erdogan did a couple of things. He institutionalized basically national health care. And uh, this is enormously significant. He also put in some socioeconomic measures for women uh, um, who are, you know, housewives and mothers, enabling them to stay basically at home, right? It's this populist uh, uh, policy of, of a de demographic policy, stay at home and have more children for the nation. But as we have seen, the real economic agenda of Erdogan is to support the building sector in the country, the building sector, which has deep transnational ties, the spread of telecommunications, the spread of you know, uh, cell phones, etc., the internet, which he can now control, okay? So the, the populist ideology has gone along with a, a globalizing economic agenda that has in fact served a kleptocratic elite that is very much part of his family. I think you, one has to understand the political economy of familialism that seems to me to be very much a part of populism, whether it is Trump and his family, whether it is you know, Orban and his cohorts, whether it is Erdogan, or whether it was the Argentinian model of Peron, okay? Uh, we, we need to understand why populist, populism permits this kind of political economic familialism. So in that sense, uh, forgive me, but I am very skeptical about the democratic promise of populist movements. If we are talking about something more like a kind of, and sometimes I think, Nadia, this is what you have in mind, a kind of Gramscian mobilization of large sectors of the population in the name of big, in the name of shared ideals, then why don't we just talk about that? Rather than, you know, using and misusing a term which began as, you know, uh, we know with the concept of the Narod, the Narodnik in the Russian Revolution. It was anti-Semitic, it was agrarian, it was anti-modernist, it was anti-elitist. I mean, the history of the movement contains some of these elements which keep, which keep coming up. So the contradictions of populism is what I'd like us to talk about a little bit in the panel. 
Okay, thank you, Sheila. Now, obviously, we have enough um, grounds for debate among the four pa panelists first. I want to give the ones that came first, Nadia and Craig, the chance to respond to basically the other presentations and then uh, to see whether anybody else wants to say something before we open the floor for discussion. So, Nadia, Craig, would you like to? Well, let me be clear. I don't want to. Um, well, I, I, I was working on this topic since the last last years. No, I don't think that populism is a, a promise of democracy. Populism develops from inside of uh, an idea of voluntary organization of the people, or voluntary participation of the people. And in this sense, you cannot say that is outside of democracy. It is a way of deforming democracy or making it risky and transforming into a risky game even more than it is naturally. So this is clear. Second, the people. There is, a, of course, a, you know, an encyclopedia long uh, trajectory of what the people means here. But if we agree that uh, the constitutional conception of the Euro, uh, the fictional Yuri, the people that is in the constitution is not the people that populism refers to. It is the people as a, uh, a representation of us against them, as Abishai said, and the them, this depends from the country in which it develops. In some countries, the them can be the uh, immigrants in other countries, they can be, you know, the socialists or, or the liberals, I don't know. So the them is crucial. It, it is a representation of a people by exclusion. Does it is a kind of uh, selecting from the people, the two people. And there is one though, one category that is crucial, in my view at least to understand the uh, populism, wherever you are, the, regardless of the context, the attack on the establishment uh, in, uh, in order to make themselves be anti-establishment. And this, and this game is the game of, poly, of, of populism because once they are in power, if they go in power, they have to prove every day that they are not like the establishment. So they are permanently campaigned like we see everywhere. So it is an important game, this one. Now, is this a way of saying that they are against the elite? Of course they say so, but they are not. It is a way of circulation of the elite. It is the formation of a new elite in a quick way to create a new. So all this dirty game of politics. The only thing I would like to ask to, to Craig, I like your presentation, is the following. In what sense you say anti-republicanism? Because I do understand that republicanism from 18th century on, it means the rule of law, the constitution, division of power. But the language of populism is inside of the Roman tradition. The populist versus the Senate is truly a, a, a kind of uh, a prior to our language. In some sense, it is perhaps a critical against the republicanism as a constitutional theory of politics, but not against republicanism as the dualism between the few and the many, the plebs and the senates, which is a kind of, uh, you know, uh, food for populism in some sense. So this is, would be my question to, to, uh, to, uh, to you. Thank you. So oh, great, thanks. Let me begin with your question, Nadia, just to say I agree completely um, and I want to elaborate. First, I agree that populism is ancient. It didn't start with Narodniki. Um, and it's a um, mistake to fail to embed it within a longer history, even before the Romans. It's the worry. I mean, in a sense, Plato thought all democracy was populism. And therefore, it had to be hemmed in by a variety of institutions. You know, Aristotle comes up with a proto-Republican theory, Rome perfects it, and Nadia's account in that sense is, I think, right. Um, and so a voice of the people, a limited voice of the people um, uh, is there. Um, and the risk of the tribunes, the people being bad demagogues is there already in Rome. Um, we could see Savonarola um, in Renaissance Florence as a classic populist. There is no more perfect image of the populist than Savonarola. I'm sorry, I can't hear you, Nadia. Your microphone is muted. Well, um, so anyway, I think um, 
throughout the history of republicanism, there is this um, tension of how much, if any, can popular voices and um, the idea of we the people be admitted. And in the modern era with the US revolution forward and so forth, the, um, some very Republican thinkers decide they can have more democracy, more voice of the people, but they have to limit it. So they have the Senate, not just the Congress. They have a variety of institutions uh, to limit it. And when I said anti-Republican, I don't mean that many populists are reading political theory textbooks and debating um, with uh, John Pocock. I mean that they are hostile to the limits that have been put in place to try to preserve the Republic. Now, I'm not trying to argue Chantal Mouffe's case. Um, I do think that populism sometimes has been progressive, but that one can by no means count on that, partly because populism is not itself an ideology. Uh, Nadia calls it a game, that's not bad. Um, that is, it's a mode of mobilization, which can be taken up by leaders with different views. Um, it can be captured and manipulated by different elites. The, the leaders of populist movements are not the non-elite um, lowest level of the um, society or something. And those leaders may attach it to an ideology, left or right or other, or they may be more venial and familiarist, as Shayla suggests. The opportunity is created for the capture of populism for self-interest, not just for ideology. So there are contradictions of populism, to be sure, I agree, good phrase. And the contradictions center on who are the people, as Abishai says, the, the potential not only for the exclusion of outsiders like immigrants, but for imposition of conformity of a standard model of what it means to be the people, the one right way to be a member of this nation. So that's a, a key contradiction. But there are contradictions of liberalism too, in this sense, including the contradiction between economic and political liberalism and uh, um, the um, individual as property owner, um, uh, you know, understood ideologically so that corporations even become individuals or mere creations of contract, contract um, and, and the more you know, political rights bearing individual. Um, the moment of uh, disintegration of Republican institutions as Shayla just put it, follows from and is inextricably tied to previous disintegration. Populists don't start the disintegration. Populists arise in the context of both limits on popular participation and the disintegration um, of the society in various ways. And that disintegration, if I were dating this for most of the modern West, certainly the US, I would say has a 1970s tipping point um, in which there is an increasing pulling apart, not just an inequality, but other kinds of pulling apart. And the populist game in Nadia's sense arises in that context, but cannot be understood as though populism were simply an ideology bringing its populist views out of nowhere to this it's a reaction. It's embedded in uh, relation to what's gone before historically. Um, finally, more populism may not be the solution. In saying that populism um, expresses democratic uh, uh, frustrations and populism um, calls our attention to various issues of social solidarity, that doesn't mean populism offers a solution. This is the sense in which I'm not arguing Chantal Mouffe's case. Um, the solution may be better republicanism, but we have to look at the sense in which people have failed to uphold the stronger, more robust republicanism and failed to build the social solidarity, which would be the support for a more cohesive social participation in that. Uh, if I'm allowed to- just add one thing? May I just say one thing that- Sarah, please. Uh, yeah, very ahead. briefly. Uh, uh, you know, by going to the 19th century and the Narodniki, I was talking about a modernist movement and modern movement. The uh, term populism, of course, if we want to go back to the history of political thought, uh, all this would be a different, you know, conversation. And as you know, 
uh, the term democracy was very often identified with mob rule and what even Aristotle defines as constitutional republican uh, form uh, of some kind of you know, government. I, I agree with that, but I think that we have to be careful about the um, sanctification or the romanticization associated with the term the people. I want to know who the people are going to be other than the constitutional referent of the demos. And we can't just do as if these are all well interchangeable and so on. No, they're not. No, they're not. The constitutionally demarcated people has its own problems, but the evocation of uh, the people, as we know, you know, from Carl Schmitt onwards is never an innocent gesture, okay? But I want, I, I agree that there are progressive aspects, moments to populist mobilization. And I wasn't just setting out the contradictions of populism, Craig, where there are contradictions in every political theory that we can think of. But I want, I was just posing a challenge to the uh, to our panel. What is the political economy moment in populism that enables mobilization of the people, but then at the end ends up sacrificing the people to the established capitalist order, okay? And this is the, also the interpenetration as we know of the national and the global from Saskia's work. The national elites are not opposed to global elites. The national elites are those who bring in the global industries, telecommunications, building the internet, et cetera. So I was just asking us to be a bit, uh, you know, more specific about this current moment in, uh, in populism. May I join in? Yes, please, Avisai, please. Well, one thing is the obsession of the leaders in populist movements with the media. And I think the media is actually part of, an essential part of the story. When Berlusconi was in power, and in a way he was one of the first of this wave, he owned three television channels. He was the owner. Erdogan and Netanyahu and Urban and Modi, they want to get hold of the media. They don't own it, but through legislation, through how they want to own the media. And the idea is that the media is a substitute by a soft power or relatively soft power, then a coup d'etat or a putsch. You can basically control a great deal of the public life by controlling the media. And the obsession with the media is very much there. There is also a streak of populism, which is, I find interesting, is that, the, that many of those leaders Salvini and others, they are buffoons. They think that they have good time to the people, to their, in the gatherings, in the, the buffoonery is interesting. I mean, the whole thing of cruel jokes on the expense of the others. Now, about the exclusion, which was my main point. The main thing about, I mean, obviously waves of immigration are used as a trigger for populist movements. But uh, if you look at what, what they capitalize on is the immigrants who are already in those states, not the newcomers, but it's turned mostly against the Hispanic in America, well, in the in United States, well, already there. So it's not just by trying to raise the issue of immigration, you turn against those segments of those citizens in your country that you find 
as an alien force, potential betrayers. And I think that the point is, and I think is we try too much to say what's wrong with us that bring about populism. As if the first thing is soul searching, what went wrong with us people? And then try to, to do sort of a certain kind of gesture, intellectual gesture, a narodnik gesture. After all, the narodnik movement in Russia was an elitist, an elitism, and a, a very pronounced form of elitism. What I'm saying is, first see what's wrong with populism and concentrate on that. Then we shall see what's wrong with us. And the order of things politically, I think is crucial here. Thank you very much. Obviously, uh, there is never enough time. I suggest that we gather the questions that you, Sophia, basically go and read all the questions, give us 10, 15 minutes, and then we'll give two minutes for each of the panelists to have the last word. Okay, we have a bit of a hybrid as usual. Some people have written their questions down and some have, um, would like to speak them out loud. So, so to speak, please be very brief. Yes, so the first question was written and it's, how do you, the panel, define solidarity? Politics are using the term in the context of, cri of crises like the 2008 financial crisis or today with COVID, but less with the crisis of populism. It seems too vague. This is from Rui Marquez in Germany. Um, and then we have another written question. I can put those together and then maybe we can do the spoken right. ones afterwards. Okay. Yes, please. So uh, this is from Angela who's one of our students, says, could you please comment more on the idea of Kasmute that the populist voters support democracy but don't always want to be bothered by politics? That actually what they're looking for on populist voters are a leader that knows the people and make their wishes come true, favoring a deliberative or plebiscitary democracy rather than participatory democracies. Quoting Kasmute, they, the people, want to be represented without actually participating. So maybe we can do these two first. And then we can go to some uh, oral questions and then... We should know. Let's put all the questions together okay, and okay. give them the panelists the final okay. word otherwise. Yes. Okay, so then we have from uh, Lassiri Abdullah. Um, he says a question, according to Al Tuzer, to what extent oppressive states have succeeded in fighting the pandemic compared to states where freedom is almost absolute? And then um, Gabriel asks, uh, what, uh, this is specifically for Professor Binati, what are the resources imminent to proceduralist democracy to contain its deformations or populism? For instance, it is increasingly popular to have a review of due process of lawmaking. Does this also cross the line into an epistemic conception of democracy as often is taken as often it is taken on the basis of parliamentary independent human rights or scientific procedural standards. And uh, last two, uh, to Professor uh, Calhoun uh, from Aubrey, with the view of populism that you have given, how possible would it be to stop this populism from escalating into the once experienced German Volksgemeinschaft? The national community, the national community, and all its consequences that we, and all the consequences we already know. So those are all the written questions. So let's, let's how many people have raised their hands to speak? How many uh, questions? Well, we have uh, David Ercito, one of our students, uh, Del Munim, and Albana have uh, asked. So let's go through it, and then we'll give the four, the final panelists. Then okay. the, so the David, go ahead. Okay, hello. Hello everyone, thank you for the nice conversation. I actually wanted to make one question to Professor Urbinati um, that gave me nice lectures as well on, uh, on populism. So we, we had talked a lot about these things. Um, you mentioned before that uh, it was, I mean, what you mentioned before was very interesting regarding the advent of science in an era where ignorance nowadays cannot be allowed, especially since it provokes death 
And I mean, it provokes the spreading of the virus. Um, the main issue that I see with these things is that science is not a united community, as you said before, uh, but this thing can be exploited by populism. And I think that populists have done so in the past by demonizing science in this sort of neo-romanticist um, conception of life where, where emotions have to come up first than science. And they, I, I think that they can capitalize on science, equating it to technocracy, and therefore twist the argument around about uh, who really endangers democracy. So I, would, uh, I just wanted to ask you directly, um, how would you respond to this? And uh, I mean, how would this be uh, accounted for? Thank you very much. And I- uh, Thank you, just... Sophia. Who is next? next? Abdel Munim. Okay. Go ahead. I think you can speak now. Hello? Abdel? Uh, maybe we can uh, go to- um, Okay, let's, let's go to the next. Albana. Uh, unmuting, yeah. Uh, very glad that um, Sheila so insistently raised the question about the political economy of uh, behind populism, because this is more generally the question about the conditions of possibility, right? Not just the normative or institutional parameters. Uh, well, I want to. I've, I've suggested that uh, it is a certain transition. Uh, beyond the neoliberal uh, free market logic and around the turn of the century, um, the, the dominant logic of uh, policy making was to ensure the national competitiveness in the global economy. So first we globalize capitalism and then we start handpicking specific companies, uh, national champions to ensure the national competitiveness. So that switch from glo intensified global competition to national kind of a national uh, uh, state sponsored um, uh, engineering of, of the economy uh, is uh, that uh, engine of the massive precarization because you, while you are prioritizing, while um, you're supporting specific companies, then the pressure on everybody else intensifies. So in my reading, this is this massive precarization of society in that sense of increasing the competitive pressures on all, then, then certain groups who, who, who sit at the very bottom of that stratification of precarity uh, be, uh, see everybody else as the enemy. This is the, like the, short, the short story of that political economy of precarity. Uh, Sophia, is this all or do we have somebody else? Well, Abdel Munim is now available. Okay, so please. So allowed to talk. Okay, Abdel Munim. The floor is yours. Abdel Munim. Hello. Okay, I think that we have to leave it at that. Let's give three minutes to each of the panelists to address whichever questions have been raised, those which have been raised to their presentations or are simply address whichever points you think are relevant. So please, Nadia, I know that you wanted to, so you start Nadia and yeah, we'll go uh, in the same order we, we started. Thank you so much. Those are so many questions, but I'd like to focus on one that connects to several or three at least, the, um, the question of technology, science and non, uh, participation, but in fact, following more than being actively participant. So I think in my view, at least, but uh, this allows me also to say something about what, uh, what is, uh, oh, yeah, you left, you left. Oh, Avishai said, yes, it's true that we should connect populism to the transformation of democratic societies, not societies, systems and, and institutions, not society. Meaning what we have uh, uh, now is a populistic reaction to a situation that is completely changed in relation to how democracy was. It is based on organized parties or organized masses in which uh, interests were connected and organized, in which leaders were not left alone, but based on a organized and collective sense of the party. Now, these in the democracy of the public, to use a Bernard Manen effective uh, way of saying, it is a disaggregation of uh, people 
because of precarization, they, 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 even the unions are these are in disarray. So in this case, it is an easy ground, an easy tumor, you will say, for, for the formation of uh, leadership as uh, the dukes, uh, as the leader in this sense. So does it is true that populism has to do with the transformation of representation from a party's representation to embodiment into, into a leader. And this doesn't mean that it's more, it is a more a call for participation. I don't believe that is a fact, the call for this participation. It's a call for somebody who, can, who is like us, like us, so they speak in a very buffoon like, like everybody can do. They don't have any kind of specialization or competence. They're like us, this as if we were like us, it's very important. This, definition of representation and this is a way of saying no participation but following and thus uh, i think there are several uh, articles coming up now on very interesting on technology or technocratic uh, solutions and populism because they are somehow not so antithetical the technocracy and the and the and the, and the populist because populism is a quest for objective not partisan not pluriparties uh, organization of the of the policy and that they would prefer to have a people a leader who can fix things do things uh, in the way uh, in which is more capable of doing using its own competences so it's, it's it's not a call for more participation it's a call for homogeneous kind of masses without internal pluralization of ideology or interest they it is an, it is an attack against partisan pluralism and pluriparties, they detest the parties and the populists because it's a way of fragmenting the people and thus making the few an easy game to gain uh, uh, victory. So they want to unify the masses to have a leader spoke, speaking for them and doing for them. They don't want to do things, doing for them and to eliminate, as Grillo, Beppe Grillo used to say, to eliminate uh, um, the partisanship for politics and go back to data, go back to uh, participate in the objectivity. So we are one people with the good uh, leaders doing all the stuff in the job for us. I think this is an important issue that we undermine uh, sometimes when we represent populism as simply a reaction in the name of the good people against the bad people. We should understand how these reactions operate in a society in which parties are in disarray, Representative democracy is uh, in the object, is a object of the station. So this is a redefinition of representation in a domain of uh, uh, of uh, um, uh, media uh, uh, that is the public instead of uh, the citizens. It's the public, the real judge, the real big eye that uh, operates uh, in this domain. So this is my answer, perhaps messy one, but I'm sorry. There are too many things to be said. Okay, thank Nadia. Thanks, Craig. Uh, your last three, four minutes for your final comments to whichever the issues you want to address. Okay, I'll do the, the best I can. Um, first, I think it's less helpful to ask what is wrong with populism than to ask what is wrong with specific populist leaders or interventions or styles. Um, to essentialize populism and to imagine that it is an ideology and then wrong is to sort of miss. That's why I like Nadia's image of the game. It's a, a mode of playing a political game which can be captured or led by various uh, different leaders. And it's important, I think, that, that we attack leaders and bad actions, not followers. Um, we risk replicating the very failure of inclusion um, of the uh, populist movements by excluding people who are, um, are mobilized in this way, who don't have to be mobilized in this way. They were available to be mobilized in other ways and weren't. Um, and we also, um, we elites sometimes um, also rebel against them because they are undignified. Part of what, you know, but the populists just are undignified. And I, I experience this too. I mean, it makes my skin crawl. Um, but that's not a true political objection. Um, similarly, racism is real. It's, it's you know, central, but it's not the whole story. If you look at UK Brexit, you have to look at geographic divisions. I mean, 
all of the net economic growth of the UK in the last 40 years was in London, Manchester, um, and their environs, essentially. Um, the rest of the country not. Um, the Gilets jaunes express you know, the tension between a metropolitan France and a non-metropolitan France. So there, you know, there may be all these problems. I don't see them as the hope for the future, but I think you have to look at the sociological um, underpinnings of what, what comes. Um, even with the question of, of immigrants and all, you know, yes, there is this element of looking at them as alien and betrayers, but also as competitors. Um, and that's why the hostility, which is often expressed in terms of, oh, they're getting welfare benefits, is really things like they're getting places at universities that we thought our kids would get. Um, they are um, succeeding, and the hostility is as much to the successful immigrants as the non. Um, it's not just a question of the bad old elites or beating up ourselves. It's a question of looking at the institutional crisis, which, as Albina puts it, creates the conditions of possibility for populism. Um, I agree very much about the centrality of precarity, but I think also the parties in most of the advanced democracies were essentially broken. Um, the party system was broken by the time these populist movements started. They were giving it, you know, um, death knell, but it was already largely broken. Um, with regard to the question about solidarity, what does it mean? Uh, it's a long, I can't be long-winded, but I would say it means being in a collecting fate and knowing it. Social cohesion, but also not, it, it requires not just the idea, oh, I express solidarity, but we are really interconnected in basic ways. Um, and here again, precarity, privatization of risk is a problem with that. People are not, they, uh, they are in very different life circumstances where policies affect them very differently. Um, to the question that invoked Cass uh, Muda, yes, populism is an episodic engagement, not a consistent participatory structure, and it risks being publicitary. Um, I think Avishai is right to bring in the media. I will just say quickly, this is the most truly modern um, element of populism. But what we have to see is that it's also a partial substitute for organization. Populists have the combination of media and demagogues as a substitute for having meaningful organizational structures. The most important version of that in the modern world is the labor movement. The decline of the labor movement, the absence of organizational structures, but also other kinds of organizational structures is basic to this conditions of possibility. Um, finally, to the, the question of um, national socialism and all that, I think a short answer, and it, it demands more, is yeah. social democracy was an available opportunity. Yeah, yeah. It was an available opportunity that was resisted by liberals and betrayed by communists. And so it's not just that populism grew into the Nazi movement and other um, completely negative forms, it's that the ability to build other kinds of institutional structures was actively undermined. Um, uh, and um, therefore the institutions were not strengthened and therefore we got what we got. Uh, thank you, Craig, for your attempt to almost address every question. Abisai, your last three minutes, please. Well, I mean, Craig already addressed all the questions. <laughs> what? I think that there is, there is a genuine need for analyzing the global phenomenon of uh, populism. It's true that for political activists who try to counter populism, you have to address the specific form in your body politics. And therefore you should address, let's say, for me in Israel, the form in which it takes. And, and someone in, in Turkey, Turkey populism or Hungarian populism. But it is, I believe, of, out, of real importance to see what all populists have in common. For example, the, in many cases, in many in many countries, it's the corruption of the leaders. Usually they are under threat, of, they are brought to court, 
Netanyahu just two days ago, and Trump and Erdogan. Usually it's what Sheila said, the family are always engaged in some kind of corruption or Modi in, in India. And therefore you start attacking the judiciary system. So part of the populism is what part of the conspiracy of the elite is trying to rule through the judiciary system, through the courts, through the constitution. So I think that once you see that there is a pattern here in many places, different form, then I think you are more equipped to deal with the specific form in which it takes in your country and see what is specific and what is common and what is the right strategy in case you find. And I agree with Craig, populism is a disposition, not an articulated ideology. It's a, an attitude more than an opinion, but there is something common there in, in all its various forms. And uh, I think that the question about solidarity here is important. Solidarity, like there are many terms in political thinking which suffer from actually from pregnant ambiguity. Individual, take individual, it can be the narrowest term, the thinnest of terms that our society consists of individuals and individual to become a full-fledged individual is an achievement of the highest degree and to which we aspire. So when we talk about the solidarity needed for current democratic states is mutual responsibility as citizens. And it's a minimal idea. It's not the, it's not, there are forms of solidarity that demands far more. But the problem about the exclusion is to, to basically count on the idea that only the true people can share and have solidarity of the right kind. And therefore I'm advocating the solidarity needed for citizenship and not any, shall I say, thick idea of solidarity. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> Please, um, Sheila. Uh, I want to go back to something that Nadia said, a couple of things that, which are very important. One of the consequences of the current crisis is uh, mass unemployment. We're talking about in the US 20 to 25%. These are unbelievable, inconceivable numbers. And it is quite likely that at the end of this, if there is an end, that we're going to be facing radically transformed workplaces, radically transformed balance between the private and the public, our own Ban. It's not clear to me how higher education is going to come back. We may all be teaching like this for months and months. It's not bad. I mean, I'm not against this medium. I enjoy seeing everybody. But our universities are all going to be to be radically, radically transformed. So whatever this new normal is, I don't know if it will ever be, be normal. So in this context, Plus the disarticulation of the party structures, the collapse of the party structures that Craig also mentioned, uh, there are going to be different kinds of movements that are arising. And I don't know if we will call them uh, populist or not. Uh, one thing that has become very clear to me, watching the Trump administration deal with this crisis is how I mean, I'm sorry if I'm sounding again 
just like the, my, my Marxist conscience has been awakened, how incredibly class and race and ethnic specific the burden of this crisis has been. When you look at the numbers in the United States of the death among the black and Hispanic people compared to the white elites and so on, I mean, I, I, I can't begin to think about about New York, you know, it's just what's happened in the country. There is been such a sort of pulling apart of the curtain. Um, also on the Trump administration, I'll be, this is my last word. This was an administration that spoke a populist language, a language of ressentiment, mobilization against the, against the meritocratic elites but it is an administration that is just like fundamentally betrayed and will be the American people unless the Democrats can push through all these, all these economic, economic uh, measures because there is a serious way in which, and this is another conversation, I'll, I'll listen to what Craig is saying. I fear a great unraveling of the social fabric in the, in the United States states and whether this will be mobilized in a way that port by a social justice movement by an economic reconstruction and a green new deal uh, you know we we really we really need uh, need that and whether it will be populism or something else i would much rather well i'm just going to stop there it's uh, it's another conversation but I did want to bring in the sense of, you know, social panic that I have about what's going on right now in the United States. Thank you, Sheila. Thank you all. Uh, we could go on and on because obviously those are very, very serious issues, but we have to stop. I wanted to stop at 12.30. We're already a few minutes beyond. Um, thank you to the four panelists. Thank you to all discussions. We had a, a fantastic conversation. Thank you so much. And which kind of a break do we take, uh, Sophia? I also wanted to thank uh, the interpreters who are working in the background or not for those who are listening in. And uh, I think we can take, I think we should take maybe five minutes because it was a very intense dis discussion, but I don't think there was a break really foreseen. So really only five, five minutes. Okay, very good. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I'm leaving. Bye. Bye, Professor. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye, Sulita. <laughs> what a strange word is this one. Where are you, Sabita? In New York? Are you in New York? I'm uh, actually not in New York. I'm in uh, out on Long Island. So oh, close. And Sadita, where are you? Oh, you cannot hear me. Or maybe the. David, where are you now? David Rasmussen, I mean. Uh, it's out. <laughs> okay. So bye, everybody. Nadia, nice Nadia, to see you in, in New York. No, I am in, in, in Italy. Are you in Italy? Yeah. I'm in Brussels. Nadia, is it Nadia? Bye, Nadia, is that you? Hi, hi. Hi, Nadia. <laughs> hi. Hi, David. <laughs> hi, Nadia. David, how are you? Hi, Sandro, how are you? Where are you, Nadia? I'm in Bologna. In Bologna. Good. Sandro, yeah. you're in Rome? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> at home. It's uh, what a strange word, right? It's, it's so, it's funny so to bring, uh, to bring to the conference our homes. <laughs> exactly. The, the, the boundary yeah. between private and public. Is, uh, this is my <laughs> study. So I mean, We've <laughs> met each other in this conference for years, uh, yeah. probably 10 or more, and now coming with our homes. It's, yeah. So we are we are talking while in pyjama. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> we never be realized. Well, so we, are hiding. Ah. we are hiding to the web, right? The web shows yeah. us, but we are hiding. It's incredible. It's, it's, yeah, it is. it's a game. It's a game. Quite something. Especially given the different time zones. Yeah. Oh, different. Where are you? I assume Jose, you are at the Jose, are West you? Coast, right? Yeah. This ah, is the only are... official part. David. Yeah. YouTube has been closed, you know, the recording on YouTube yeah. has been they stopped. No, no, it hasn't well, been good. stopped. That's it's good. still live. Okay, okay, guys, guys. Uh, have a good night. Uh, good evening. <laughs> anyway, I'm not in pyjama, I... as you see. Ah. <laughs> show. <laughs> you have to prove. <laughs> I will show my pyjama then. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Good. Giancarlo, ti volevo dire, uh, we're still live on YouTube, huh? Come? We're still live on YouTube. Yeah, we're still live. Okay. Yes. So try to keep uh, an appropriate behavior. So behavior. let's be yes. Okay. So let's move to the next step. Okay. So who is? I think David was going to I, be the chair, right? I, okay. I thought I'm chairing. Who is chairing? Uh, Albena. Yes. Good. Please. Yes, Albena. And, you and chair. David. I think is, David. I think is. I um, was, but not now. On Friday. Thursday, Friday. Yeah, Friday, Friday. you're the first first panel on Friday. Okay, welcome everybody. Right, to, exactly. Yeah, shall we start? Um, welcome uh, everybody uh, yeah, to our ahead. session. Um, mm -hmm. Professor uh, Jose Casanova uh, is a professor at, um, uh, is one of the most prominent scholars of uh, religion, uh, secularism, uh, and theology in the world. So uh, I give him the floor to uh, for uh, actually a very short 30 minute talk, after which okay. we will follow with some questions. Okay, very good. So basically lessons from the global pandemic. This is individuals and communities. We could also have called my talk individualist versus communitarian states, uh, lessons from the global pandemic. Uh, so which lessons can we draw from the ongoing global pandemic for our intellectual debates and individuals and communities, for our democratic commitment to liberal, egalitarian, pluralist, and solidaristic polities and societies, and for our understanding of our global human condition. Obviously, mine are going to be personal reflections of a participant observer reflexively aware of my own situatedness in three respects. First, as a social scientist interested in understanding the religious cultural dynamics of globalization beyond the obvious uh, economic dynamics of the world capitalist system and the political dynamics of the world system of nation states. Second, uh, as a Democrat committed, however, to multiple demos, to the American demos, to the Spanish demos, to the larger European demos, and to the Ukrainian demos, to name just some of the few demos with which I feel attachment and commitment. And then as a global, Catholic, Catholic with a small c, not Roman Catholic, cosmopolitan humanist committed to the more universal common good of global humanity beyond any particular national public interest. Now, pandemics have been affecting global history and global dynamics for centuries, if not millennia. So what appears, so what appears to be new and significant about this pandemic? And I'm going to look at two things which I consider relevant. First, this was the first truly global pandemic in the sense that it became very quickly a truly global pandemic objectively in the way in which very quickly uh, it spread to all corners of the world. And it was a truly global pandemic phenomenologically in the sense that it was experienced simultaneously and synchronically by peoples from all over the world at the same time. A comparison with a very similar, biologically very similar SARS epidemic of 2000, 2000 2003 makes this evident. The SARS epidemic had a very similar origin. 
It originated in Guangdong in southern China, and it very quickly spread to neighboring countries in East Asia and Southeast Asia, but mainly it remained confined to East Asia and particularly to places with large Cantonese diasporas, Hong Kong, Taiwan, Singapore, and interestingly enough, Toronto. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, by contrast, very soon spread all over China and very quickly all over the world, carried by basically global airlines. Partly the difference is due to the contingent fact that this time it coincided with the Chinese New Year, a time when the entire population of China is on the move within China, but also throughout the world as global tourists and as global entrepreneurs. The comparison between the spread of SARS and COVID-19 is an indicator of the relatively much greater centrality of China within the global economy, but also to the growing number of Chinese who are global expatriates and tourists beyond the old historical Chinese diasporas. My own experience of the unfolding of the pandemic took place while I was in Ukraine for two weeks. You have a lot of Ukrainian immigrants in Italy who precisely were returning back home as the uh, pandemic unfolded in Italy. And then I spent one week in Prague precisely as countries were closing their borders. And I was stuck in Prague. I took a flight out of Prague, probably the last one through Turkish Airlines, through Istanbul. And I arrived on Saturday the 14th, the day when uh, 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 Trump had closed the borders. And basically I was an observer, participant observer of the chaos in American airports that were basically really, really rare than closing the country, bringing uh, uh, the virus into the United States. Now, um, what I want to point out, and this is the second element, the second relevant element is the fact that the COVID pandemic from the outset hit first and most dramatically the global centers of the world capitalist economy in the global north, namely East Asia, Western Europe, and the United States. And within those centers, it hit most dramatically developed urban metropolitan centers and those most open to globalization flows. Lombardy in Italy, uh, Madrid and Barcelona metropolitan areas in Spain, uh, Bavaria and Rhineland in Germany, uh, uh, the Paris metropolitan area in France, California, Seattle, and the New York metropolitan area in the United States. And only later it began to spread to the less developed, to the hinterlands of those countries. And eventually it began to spread to develop, to the less developed regions of the world. Today, we can observe that fortunately the virus, the virus appears to have been relatively contained, at least for the time being, in East Asia and Western Europe, but not yet in the UK and the US, but it is spreading most rapidly in Russia, India and the Middle East, Indonesia, Brazil, Peru, Chile, and so on, all countries which have much more diminished public health resources to deal effectively with the pandemic. Now, the fact that the pandemic spread first in the most globalized metropolitan centers in the global north is of relevance, relevance because in principle, this cannot be blamed on the underdeveloped South as was the case with many other recent pandemics. Imagine how the Lega Norte would have responded if the COVID would have spread from the Italian Mezzogiorno to the mythical Padania. But even of greater relevance is the fact that in principle, the fact of hitting first dramatically the overdeveloped North, one would expect should have helped to develop a more coordinated global response under the nuclear phenomenological experience that this time truly we are all global humanity in this together. But in fact, while the pandemic was clearly global and was experienced as such, the political response has been overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly narrowly national. One could even argue individualist and nationalist, each nation looking solely at its own self-interest in a kind of social Darwinian libertarian 
survival of the fetus instead of promoting a cosmopolitan communitarian response of consensually working together, sharing medical and epidemiological resources, knowledge and expertise, collaborating internationally and transnationally. In this respect, indeed, the global pandemic has contributed to an anti-cosmopolitan backlash, precisely when a cosmopolitan one would have been not only a better one from an ethical point of view, but also a more effective one from an epi epidemiological and global public health point of view. I mean, using on purpose the binary topology of our seminar in summer school, namely individualist versus communitarian response to the pandemic, applying it to the geopolitical level of international relations, because I am afraid that our democratic theories, but particularly our democratic realities in political analysis are so tied up with the individualist anarchic nation state and with the national demos, which is the realist outcome of centuries of international conflict of the Westphalian system that our cosmopolitanism and liberal internationalism is most weakened precisely at the time when it is most needed, namely in times of global crisis, be they pandemic, economic, environmental, or immigration and refugee crisis connected with war and failed states. If we do not take lessons from this crisis to further a new more communitarian world order based on the principle of subsidiarity, and this is a key point I want to make, at home and internationally, we are globally doomed as a planetary species, given the quasi certainty that all those global crises, epidemiological, environmental, immigration and refugees, growing economic inequality, in which large sectors of the global population are simply discarded and left behind, all these global crises are indeed increasingly interrelated are likely to explode ever more frequently and with greater force, and ultimately can only be managed effectively through global communitarian cooperation. The disastrous response, or rather non-response, of the European Union to the pandemic crisis, suspending the Schengen Agreement of Open Borders, its nation state resorting to sudden anarchic, uncoordinated, and unsolidaristic responses, of survival of the fetus has been for me as a European and a Europeanist appalling and a real shock. Despite my pessimism concerning the possibility of developing any European wide solidarity following the 2008 9 financial crisis and the way in which the so called northern frugal Protestant countries punished the so called profligate Catholic and Orthodox peaks of the South. Portugal, Italy, Ireland, Greece, and Spain. I did not expect the selfish reaction of Germany and France to the humanitarian disaster that Italy was undergoing, as if once again, the victims could be blamed morally for the natural disaster they were suffering. Most European leaders initially acted basically like Trump, unilaterally, suddenly, and without any previous communication, or consultation with each other. Now the late open decision of Germany, excuse me, the open decision of Germany and France publicly announced not to share medical resources with Italy. At the time when Italy was being overwhelmed by the pandemic, does not speak well for the future of the European Union. Although the Merkel-Macron alliance to push forward some kind of communitarian financing of the needed relief to overcome the financial costs and the consequences of the crisis precisely after the decision of the German Constitutional Court against the transnational authority of the European Central Bank is a sign of hope. We'll see how the so-called frugal nations, Holland, Denmark, Austria, and Finland respond. For me, the most important lesson from the pandemic and from the various national responses is the crucial relevance of the principle of subsidiarity for coping effectively with, with any kind of global crisis. A principle which unfortunately has been all too evidently absent nationally as well as internationally in the responses so far. 
Let me offer a brief comparison of the unfolding of the pandemic and the diverse responses in the United States and in Spain, two of the most severely hit countries in the world, to which I happen to have close political and emotional attachments. One is my country of origin, the other my country of destiny. The unfolding of the pandemic was in many ways similar. Both countries failed to respond. Effectively at the beginning when the pandemic was already recognizable. Lost precious time while the pandemic was already spreading rapidly in various areas of the country. And by the time they responded with similar measures, ordering confinement and social distancing, it was too late. The hospitals in metropolitan areas were overrun and unable to cope effectively in both countries. They were caught unprepared despite the very different public health systems. Spain was one of the most effective and egalitarian public health systems of the world by the fact that last year in 2019, Spain surpassed Japan as the country with the highest life expectancy for both male and female population. And yet both Northern Italy and Spain, both Madrid and Barcelona have new, excuse me, I, I was missing. The point is that even under those conditions, there have been very severe cuts to the public health system in Spain in the last administrations and Spain was paying the consequences. I have here a, 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 a few mentions, anecdotal about how uh, uh, the, the, the uh, virus spread. In the case of Spain and uh, Italy, they had the famous uh, soccer game in the San Siro where the Atalanta Bergamo uh, uh, club play against Valencia, basically becoming a super spreader. Bergamo became one of the epicenters of the Italian crisis. The, the players, the uh, Spanish fans and the journalists brought the pandemic into uh, uh, Spain, obviously many other groups had brought the pandemic into Spain, but it was very clear that uh, uh, those countries would have acted earlier. In this respect, it was the equivalent of the Mardi Gras celebration in New Orleans. There is now a big scandal in Spain, uh, a political one, concerning the mass demonstrations on March 9th, International Women's Day in Madrid, in Barcelona and many other cities in Spain, uh, have become contentious events. The two leftist partners in the coalition government, SOE and Unidas Podemos, competing and openly bickering during the organization and during the demonstrations as to which of the two parties represented the real feminism, SOE fighting for female equality for the majority of women, while Unidas Podemos took the more radical banner of fighting for equal rights for the LGBT communities. The experts disagree as to the role of these demonstrations in spreading the infection. Most people agree that the crowded public transport was probably much more influential. Yet yesterday, the head of the civil guard in Madrid, Pere de Cobos, was forced to resign by the Minister of the Interior after Pere de Cobos wrote a report for a judge implying that the government went ahead with the demonstrations despite knowledge of the threat of infection. While a few days earlier, the government had prohibited a convention of Pentecostal Assemblies of God on March 5, citing the threat of infection. The right, the political right in Spain is now exploiting this scandal to the point of inciting the civil guard and the armed forces to intervene to put an end to the illegitimate government which has assumed dictatorial powers. Catalan prisoners are now tweeting from prison, reminded the government that this same Pere de Cobos is the one who wrote the reports for the judicial authorities that landed the Catalan national leaders in prison. The polarization in Spain is as extreme as it is in the US, only with several fronts. Left right is one of them, but the Catalan and the Basque questions add complexity to our polarizations. The fact is that historically, only the Socialist Party has sufficiently presence in all regions of Spain to be able to, man to maintain the country together in times of crisis. But now the Spanish government declaration of the state of alarm, and here we go back to the question of a state of uh, uh, alarm, which is called or a state of uh, exception, 
uh, versus uh, um, um, basically a temporary, a temporary uh, uh, suspension of uh, administration. In the case of Spain, it has been very drastic, but every two weeks, the government has gone to parliament to extend the, the state of alarm. It has had one of the most drastic confinement uh, uh, um, uh, systems uh, of any country. Basically, everybody was uh, confined within home for six weeks without being able to go on the streets. Um, and uh, um, uh, however, now the government finds itself not anymore in the position to expand, to extend this state of alarms, which is positive. But in the process, it had changed its own uh, uh, parliamentary coalitions and basically has almost undermined the possibility of recreating the one that brought the government of the left, namely the two, the Socialists and Unidas Podemos, together with the coalition of the leftist Catalan nationalists and the Basque Nationalist Party. Under those conditions now, the conflict between the Madrid and Catalonia has re-emerged to such an extent, and the government has exchanged the Catalan leftist nationalists for Ciudadanos, which is the anti-Catalan party, and has switched in the last uh, expansion of the state of alarm, uh, switched uh, for the center nationalist party, the ETA uh, uh, associated Bildu party, and again, creating a fundamental problem for the coalition of the central government with the party. What I want to point out is that basically what we see here is the failure of the principle of subsidiarity, but the US and Spain here are almost the opposite mirrors. In the case of the US, we have a central government that simply has given up on any responsibility to take care of the national crisis, to act nationally, and are basically letting each local government, each state, and each authority to fend for themselves, competing with one another for medical resources and so on. We know the disastrous way in which the central government has basically uh, 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 dealt with the crisis. We know how already it's not simply a question of the style of government of Trump. It was simply the attempt to, 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 to clean the swamp has meant basically destroying, undermining the uh, national resources, public health experts, etc., in dealing with the crisis. In Spain, it has been the opposite. The Spain has too easily taken a radical centralist position, suspending every form of regional government, regional administration to deal with the crisis, and in the process exacerbating what was already a very serious problem of Spanish democracy, how to deal with the Catalan and the Basque crisis. And I'm afraid that in both cases, how to deal with uh, uh, basically coming out of the crisis uh, economically and in terms of public health, is going to be a very, very serious issue. So I want to argue that this principle of subsidiarity is really, really a central one that we will have to take very seriously into to account to, to, to how we understand the relations between precisely the global and the local, the center and the peripheries within each country. And especially at the European Union, we have used it, we have mentioned it, but at this moment, it is not very clear whether really the European Union is going to be able to deal successfully with, in a communitarian fashion, with the uh, financial crisis. Um, let me uh, simply uh, finish by adding that, um, uh, again, in terms of the name of the, big, the, the, the victims is very similar. In Spain, 90% of all the fatalities are actually of people over 65 years of age. It's also because we have a very, very, as I pointed out, the longest uh, life expectancy, meaning that uh, it has been, it has hit very seriously, obviously the elderly. On the other hand, uh, the same disaster of nursing homes and the way it has spread in those places in Spain and the United States, and again, at the time of confinement for the entire population, the way in which the caregivers, namely the caregivers in hospitals and in nursing homes, uh, majoritarily 
female workers and all the other essential workers that had to go uh, uh, to work, uh, bus drivers, public uh, transport uh, um, people, uh, police, uh, putting, giving fines to the people that were breaking the confinement, uh, firefighters, ambulance drivers. Uh, these are the people, of course, who have also suffered uh, most of the infections. The disproportionate number of the infected among precisely these essential workers is really, really astounding. So again, there are heavy measures in Spain of giving all this, uh, 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 um, of basically compensating all these essential workers. Uh, and they have, Spain has now extended a minimal family wage, uh, precisely to deal with the crisis, not only a question of workers, but ultimately, given the political polarization in Spain, I'm very skeptical about the possibility of really uh, uh, developing the kind of economic uh, uh, policies that will be needed to deal with the crisis. So the point I want to make again is that obviously those are all increasingly global crises that require global communitarian responses. And the lesson from the crisis has been exacerbation of the model of autarkic, self-independent, uh, uh, nation states that are not able to collaborate with one another. Uh, let's hope that the European Union is able to somehow get their act together and serves for a better model for uh, international relations than what we are seeing from the other uh, uh, superpowers in the world. But I'm not uh, very, very uh, uh, um, uh, hopeful. Uh, and especially we will see what happened with the vaccine once it is produced, whether it is controlled by the big pharma or the big geopolitical states, or whether where truly it will become a, a, a health public good that has a universal access to every human on the planet. So this is going to be a fundamental question for the global order, how we deal precisely with the uh, distribution production and distribution of the vaccine, who appropriates this public good for which purposes. So with this, I want to finish. Thank you, uh, Jose. Uh, I have here in the chat one question. Uh, prepare your questions and I will start with that while you are formulating them. Um, raise your hand or chat, send me a, a, a little note on the chat so they can collect. So we start with the uh, undebat. Uh, how do you assess the effectiveness of the two states, individualist and communalist, in terms of responding to the pandemic? For you, which one is efficient and why? Uh, obviously, I think dealing with the pandemic, both of them were individually is the two e examples. What I argue is one use fail uh, on the principle of subsidiarity by basically uh, centralizing all the power. It has been very effective, much more effective in the United States. Spain was able to even diminish the pandemic faster and probably better than Italy. So in this respect, it has been a relatively successful temporary solution. But in the process, the way it has been done by taking over the, the central power, it has basically uh, diminish the possibilities of the kind of negotiation and consensual politics mm -hmm. that will be necessary, mm -hmm. necessary in the future to deal both with the economic crisis and to how to basically organize the convivence. And the same, I would argue, at the level of, of Europe. So there are two different issues. One is the issue of the uh, effectiveness of states, obviously states that act quickly for the uh, public good, for the public health of the whole nation, are going to be more effective. The question is how it is done in any way that this is not a dictatorial exceptional power that is very hard then or that provokes a counter reaction. Okay, here's a big, uh, a big question that we cannot uh, overlook. What moral lesson can we learn from the corona pandemic, uh, Slimani is asking? Well, I already mentioned, basically, we need the principle of subsidiarity to deal with crisis. 
and we need the principle of solidarity, communitarian, both nationally and internationally. So this morally, those are the two principles we have to address, subsidiarity and solidarity. Right, very well. Jonathan Lawrence, uh, it's your next. Thank you very much, uh, Jose. Uh, really stimulating talk. Um, well, I, I actually, what I have to uh, ask follows on your on your last statement because I wonder um, whether you're calling actually for subsidiarity, which, uh, in the case of the challenges such as the virus, sometimes are really tackled most efficiently, uh, at least in the short term, uh, at the local level. And by extension, really, in terms of mechanics at the national level. And so that first retreat to the to the community or the nation state level doesn't have to be forever. Um, it might just be a, a reasonable first uh, step taken that, that, that can be undone. But um, as with the, the, the financial crisis and, and, the, and the conditions under which a bailout eventually took place, which is to say on a voluntary basis, on an intergovernmental basis and not uh, you know, in, in, in some uh, otherwise harmonized way, uh, what are you really calling for? Are you calling for more top-down international accountability ultimately? Because won't any international organization be dominated by one of the, the big powers? Um, uh, or are you calling for essentially some sort of intergovernmental compromise, in which case don't we already have it uh, in the form of a to be improved WHO? We, we, are, we, we, we have something uh, on our predecessors of other post-war scenarios in that the, the institutions in, in a sense already exist and are there for, for the taking. No, I mean, my sense was precisely that although we understand that we are a global community of nations. When it came to the pandemic, the response was truly anarchic, eh, almost in the sense of libertarian, each nation state for itself. So this is, again, my argument is even, uh, it's very clear that we need confinement. It's very clear that we need uh, a step of global movements, but the way it was done was counterproductive. Basically the idea is people use the discourse of war as if it was a foreign enemy and you close the borders and you think that this is the solution. We know that this is not the solution, but the time the borders were closed, uh, the, it had spread all over. And if the, even the closing, if it would have been done through communication uh, consensually, it would have been less chaotic and probably would have produced better results ultimately. So what I'm arguing is that even the uh, uh, exceptional response to the crisis should be consensually uh, basically, even at least within the European Union, the fact that they simply did not act as a union, but each country on its own is simply for me the, 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 the problem. Um, if this happened at the level of the European Union, I can imagine what happens obviously at the level of the United States and China dealing consensually about how to deal with the crisis. We see that if we cannot do it in the European Union, we are not going to do it in any other uh, area. Look what happens in Latin America again. It's a spreading all over Latin America. There is no coordination whatsoever. Each country for its own, totally chaotic responses of the different neighboring countries, and basically no possibility really of any of those countries uh, uh, responding effectively with the crisis. Yes, we need a World Health Organization, uh, but we need ultimately, uh, I'm arguing is not what we can do institutionally now. Uh, obviously, it's more a moral uh, uh, call for subsidiarity and solidarity for a communitarian approach to international relations. Uh, so in this respect, rather than anarchic, realpolitik of national self-interest. Um, so this is the, in terms of principles. Now, which kind of institutions are going to develop? Uh, this is obviously beyond this crisis. And, but we'll have to think about the need to add uh, uh, Institu international legal structures that somehow regulate those issues. But juridification is not the solution because neither the principle of subsidiarity nor the principle of solidarity can be juridified into, the, into constitutional roles. So there was always a pragmatic element of how to act under those conditions mm -hmm. that is based on moral uh, judgment, not necessarily on constitutional legal rules. Okay, we have next Gabriel Encinas. 
Yes, thank you very much. Uh, so my question is uh, whether you see or whether you see a lack of maybe motivational resources from religious, uh, let's say, backgrounds and maybe historicals, but also the present context, no? Because then, uh, well, uh, historically, the Latin American region, for example, uh, has been Catholic, maybe this community, yeah. And then I'm not sure if, if it correlates, no, in some sense with having solidarity or not really, or maybe some certain religious uh, aspects. What is your opinion on this? Thank you. Well, uh, and this issue, obviously, I would argue that the voice of the Pope, I mean, if you look at his latest and see, Laudato Si, is probably the, 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 the most coherent voice on how all these global crises are interconnected and how to have to deal with them. Now, the different question is how this, the, the Catholic nations, of course, do not follow their own Pope. So this is a different issue. Latin America, of course, is a, is a case of basically Catholic countries that have been totally unable to develop any kind of transnational uh, 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 mm -hmm. uh, international structure. Uh, and Medellin, it, again, it was the churches that, that began to think in Pan-American context, to think as one single continent, uh, some intellectuals did. But the ability of uh, Latin American countries to simply dealt or uh, develop international communitarian structures has been a disaster every time that anything has been. Uh, so here you have, again, the paradox of, of course, this is the paradox of Benedict Anderson, imagine communities, right? Out of one single, basically, empire, the same language, the same religion, the same culture, created 23 nations, each of them anarchic, self-centralized, uh, 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 self-interested, and with practically no communication interaction with one another. It's a, it's, it's a very, really problematic, problematic case. Okay, thank you. Next, uh, we have a question by Eleonora. Um, how ethical would be to lock humans in their homes and push them to socialize with each other online? Would it be a moral action to redefine globalization as growing interactions among human beings on digital platforms as opposed to the elimination of barriers before free movement of people, good services, capital, and technologies in the real world. Uh, this is from Eleonora Deljanin. Obviously, here, this is a question of prudential judgment. How harsh has to be the confinement? Uh, obviously, in Spain, it was extreme. But the majority of the population, even today, uh, still support the way the confinement took place. They were relatively, they follow it. Uh, the only protests have come out from the barrio de Salamanca, which is the wealthiest barrio in Madrid, basically upper middle class, basically developing the libertarian argument of liberate Minnesota, liberate barrio de Salamanca from the confinement. So you have the, the Franco is right. that obviously never, uh, had any qualms about any a state of exception or dictatorship. Now, on libertarian grounds, are basically arguing for for uh, uh, to end the state of dictatorship mm -hmm. in Spain of in the legitimate government. Obviously, uh, the problem is precisely how to create uh, the prudential judgment structures and to maintain communication. One thing was for the government in Spain to assume exceptional powers. Other want to use it not to have communication with the regional governments and to basically stop any kind of consensual administrative decisions that need to be made. So basically, again, confinement was necessary, exceptional uh, um, orders were necessary, but obviously they had to be not only legal, but also cannot stop the need for consensual negotiation and for administrative uh, um, a participation of all the stakeholders. Okay, um, thank you. Um, I don't see other questions. Are there any waving of hands? Um, 
I'm very tempted to uh, contradict a little bit your story, uh, Jose, and say, um, in fact, uh, something very curious has been happening in the European Union. The European Commission, which uh, does not have uh, normally powers in health and social policy, has taken some action in that. It created a successful procurement call which uh, the Brits uh, missed, right? It was a scandal that the British missed it. Though, so it uh, coordinated the action of European countries, which contrasted to the way uh, in the US, uh, the federal government and the states have been competing for um, safety equipment. It also issued a re reinsurance, um, an employment reinsurance policy. Um, it created a stockpile. So it has been acting in uh, health and social policy, um, probably beyond its mandate of sorts. So uh, my question is, shall we celebrate that a non-elected body is acting as a central government in Europe? Well, this has always been the problem, obviously, between the, the, the track, the, the, the Union, European Union of Nation States and which aspects are really, really uh, pan-European and therefore come out of Brussels and which are, are negotiated between the, the, the uh, sovereign uh, uh, national governments. Obviously, what you are referring is the second phase of the response. This is really after the realization of the tremendous failure that then people, and right. the same thing that the Macron uh, uh, Merkel response of last week comes after the realization that if we don't do it, the whole thing is really falling apart precisely after the, the, yeah. the German uh, Constitutional Court put right. into question the very, the very possibility of acting for European Central Bank to act meaningfully for all of Europe. So yes, we are, we are learning and I'm still hopeful that some things are happening also yeah. on the social policy and public health. Obviously, uh, I think that this is something that can be negotiated consensually. This is what I mean by the principle of subsidiarity. Those things precisely at any Makes moment, yeah. those which are closest to the problem that can best respond, have to respond. But of course, you have the central authority that when things fail, they have to take over mm -hmm. and help mm -hmm. the local authorities. So it has to be precisely uh, what yeah. I said, you, you, you can undermine the principle of solidarity from too many centralized power on the top, which was part of the problems of Brussels. And you can also fail as happens in the United States by the federal government not taking the responsibility of helping the local governments dealing effectively with the crisis. So again, you cannot juridify the principle mm -hmm. of subsidiarity, but you have to get it very seriously into account as a, as a consensual, negotiable kind yeah. of administrative decision. Thank you, uh, Jose. Thanks, everybody. I will uh, close now this session. It's very good seeing you, everybody. And um, I will pass on to uh, Sophia to tell us what happens next. <laughs> thank um, you all. Thank you very much, everybody. I think that's it for yeah. today. Um, a very long, interesting day. Um, and I think that um, now I'm going to close the meeting. And then, Jonathan, I will open your workshop. Thank you to everybody. Okay. See you. Thank you. See you tomorrow. See you tomorrow. Bye bye.